This audio belongs to list-read.com. Visit list-read.com to read full book and many other books. Thank. 1. And my mother's dying wish was for me to take a vacation. Just do it, okay, she'd said, tucking a lock of hair behind my ear. Just book a trip and go. Like normal people do. I hadn't taken a vacation in eight years. But I'd said, okay, the way you do when you're sick mom asks for something. Then I'd added, as if we were negotiating, I'll take one vacation. Of course, I hadn't realized it was her dying wish at the time. I thought we were just making middle-of-the-night hospital conversation. But then, suddenly, it was the night after her funeral. I couldn't sleep, and I kept thrashing around in my bed, and that moment kept coming back to me. The way she'd held my gaze and squeezed my hand to seal the deal as if taking a vacation could be something that mattered. Now it was three in the morning. My funeral clothes were draped over a chair. I'd been waiting to fall asleep since midnight. Fine. Fine, I said, out loud in bed, to no one. Then I bella called across the covers to find my laptop on the floor, and, in the blue light of the screen, eyes half closed. I did a quick search for cheapest plane ticket to anywhere, found a site that had a list of non-stop destinations for $76, scrolled like I was playing roulette, landed randomly on Toledo, Ohio, and clicked purchase. Two tickets to Toledo. Non-refundable, it would turn out. Some kind of Valentine's Day lovebirds package. Done. Promise fulfilled. The whole process took less than a minute. Now all I had to do was force myself to go. But I still couldn't sleep. At five in the morning, just as the sky was starting to lighten, I gave up, dragged all my sheets and blankets off the bed, shuffled to the walk-in closet, curled up on my side in a makeshift nest on the floor, and conked out, at last, in the windowless darkness. When I woke, it was four in the afternoon. I jumped up in a panic and stumbled around my room, buttoning my shirt wrong and kicking my shin on the footboard as if I were late for work. I wasn't late for work, though. My boss, Glenn, had told me not to come in. Had forbidden me to come in, actually. For a week. Don't even think about coming to work, he'd said. Just stay home and grieve. Stay home? And grieve? No way was I doing that. Especially since, now that I'd bought these tickets to Toledo I needed to find my boyfriend, Robbie, and force him to come with me. Right? Nobody goes to Toledo alone. Especially not for Valentine's Day. It all seemed very urgent in the moment. In another state of mind, I could have simply texted Robbie to stop by after work and just pleasantly invited him to come with me over dinner and drinks. Like a sane person. Maybe that would have been a better plan. Or led to a better result. But I wasn't a sane person at the moment. I was a person who'd slept in her closet. By the time I made it to the office that afternoon, just as the work day was ending, my hair was half brushed, my shirt was half tucked in, and my funeral pantsuit still had a program with my mom's high school graduation photo on the cover folded up in the jacket pocket. I guess it's weird to head into work the day after your mom's funeral. I'd researched it, and the most common bereavement leave from work was three days, though Glenn was making me take five. Other things I'd researched as my sleepless night wore on, how to sell your parents' house, fun things to do in Toledo, a surprisingly long list, and how to beat insomnia. All to say, I wasn't supposed to be here. That's why I hesitated at Glenn's office door. And that's how I wound up accidentally eavesdropping and overhearing Robbie and Glenn talking about me. Hannah's going to shit an actual brick when you tell her was the first thing I heard. Robbie's voice. Maybe I'll make you tell her. That was Glenn. Maybe you want to rethink it entirely. There's nothing to rethink. And that was enough. I pushed open the door. What are you rethinking entirely? Who's going to tell me what? 
why exactly am I going to shit a brick? Later, I'd glimpse myself in the mirror and get a specific visual for what the two of them saw in that moment as they turned toward my voice and let's just say it involved bloodshot eyes, half my shirt collar crumpled under my jacket lapel, and a significant amount of tear smeared eye makeup left over from the day before. Alarming. But Glenn wasn't easily alarmed. What are you doing here, he said. Get out. He also wasn't a coddler. I staked my territory in the doorway with a power stance. I need to talk to Robbie. You can do that outside of work. He wasn't wrong. We were practically living together. When we weren't working, that is. Which was most of the time. But what was I supposed to do? Go stand in the parking lot? Five minutes, I bargained. Nope, Glenn said. Go home. I need to get out of my house, I said. I need something to do. But Glenn didn't care. Your mother just died, he said. Go be with your family. She was my family, I said, careful to keep my voice steady. Exactly, Glenn said, like I'd made his point for him. You need to grieve. I don't know how to do that, I said. Nobody does, Glenn said. You want a manual? I gave him a look. If you've got one. Your manual is, get out of here. But I shook my head. I know you think I need to, I hesitated for a second, not exactly sure what he thought I needed to do, sit around and think about my mom, or whatever. But, honestly, I'm fine. Then I added, and this wasn't untrue. We weren't even that close. You were close enough, Glenn said. Scram. Just let me, file things. Or something. No. I wish I could say that Glenn, built like a tank with a bald head freckled like somebody had sprinkled them from a shaker, was one of those bosses who seemed gruff but really had your best interest at heart. But Glenn mostly had Glenn's best interest at heart. And Glenn had clearly decided I wasn't fit for work right now. I got it. It had been a strange time. I'd barely made it home from an assignment in Dubai when I got a call from the ER that my mother had collapsed in a crosswalk. Suddenly, I was arriving at the hospital to find that she couldn't stop throwing up, and she didn't know what year it was or who was president. Then getting a diagnosis from a doctor with lipstick on her teeth that my mom had end-stage cirrhosis and trying to argue with the doctor, saying, she doesn't drink anymore. She does not drink anymore. Then, that evening, going to her place to get her fuzzy socks and favorite throw blanket and finding her hidden stash of vodka. Frantically pouring every last bottle down the kitchen sink and running the faucet to wash away the smell thinking all the while that my biggest challenge was going to be getting her to turn her life around. Again. Assuming there would be more time. Like we all just always do. But she was gone before I even fully realized that losing her was possible. It was a lot. Even Glenn, who had the emotional intelligence of a jackhammer, understood that. But the last thing I wanted to do was stay home and think about it. I was going to talk him into letting me come back to work if it killed us both. And then I was going to talk Robbie into coming to Toledo. And then maybe, just maybe, I could get some sleep. In a power move that kind of dared either of them to stop me, I walked farther into the office and sat down in the empty chair across from Glenn's desk. What are you talking about? I asked, shifting the subject a little. Are you having a meeting? We're having a conversation, Glenn said, like he knew I'd eavesdropped. You don't have conversations, boss, I said. You only have meetings. Robbie, handsome as ever with black lashes edging his blue eyes, met my gaze like I'd made a good point. I took a second to appreciate him. My mom had been so impressed the first time I introduced her. He looks like an astronaut, she'd said, and that was exactly right. He also had a buzz cut, drove a vintage Porsche, and was wildly overconfident. In the best, sexiest, most astronautish way. 
my mom was impressed with me for dating him. I was impressed with myself, to be honest. Robbie was not just the coolest person I'd ever dated, he was the coolest person I'd ever met. But that wasn't the point. I turned back to Glenn. What is it, exactly, that you're going to make Robbie tell me? Glenn sighed, like I guess we're doing this. Then he said, I was going to wait until you had, he looked me over, at least taken a shower, but we're opening a branch in London. I frowned. A branch in London? I asked. How is that bad news? But Glenn kept going. And we're going to need somebody to. My hand flew up. I'll take it. I've got it. I'm in. Set up the office there and get it established, Glenn finished. For two years. Hello? London? Going to London with a huge project that would require so much workaholism that nothing else would even matter for two whole years. Screw the vacation. Sign me up. Just the thought sent relief breaking over me like waves, a life obliterating work project like that could potentially distract me from all my problems forever. Yes, please. But that's when I noticed Robbie and Glenn looking at me funny. What? I asked glancing between them. It's going to be one of the two of you. Glenn said then, gesturing between Robbie and me. Of course it was. I was the protege Glenn had been grooming for years, and Robbie was the sexy hotshot he'd stolen away from the competition. Who else would even be in the running? I still didn't see the problem. And that means, Glenn went on, that whoever doesn't go will need to stay here. But that's how much I loved my job, even the prospect of a two-year separation from my boyfriend didn't faze me. Like, at all. That's also how desperate I was to get back to work. I'll announce the London decision after New Year's, Glenn said. And until then, consider yourselves in competition for the spot. There was no competition. I was getting that spot. It's fine, I said with a shrug like what? We've competed before. I nodded at Robbie. We like competing. And two years is not that long, no matter who wins. We can make that work, right? If I'd been paying better attention, I might have noticed that Robbie was less eager about everything than I was. But I was a little too desperate in that moment to think about anyone but myself. I was afraid to feel the full impact of losing my mother. I was terrified to get stuck at home with nothing to distract me. I was tunnel visioned on escaping, preferably to a distant country, as soon as possible. Next week, Robbie and I were scheduled for a three week assignment in Madrid together, but I wasn't even sure how I'd make it that long. First, I had to survive my remaining bereavement days. From what I just eavesdropped, I said, gesturing back at the doorway, I was expecting bad news. That wasn't the bad news, Robbie said, glancing at Glenn. I looked over at Glenn, too. What's the bad news? Glenn refused to hesitate. The bad news is I'm taking you off Madrid. Looking back, me showing up at the office like that, all wild-eyed and bedheady and desperate, probably wasn't helping. Maybe I should have seen it coming. But I didn't. Off Madrid? I asked thinking I must have heard wrong. Robbie fixed his gaze at the window. Off Madrid, Glenn confirmed. Then he added, you're not in the right headspace. But. I didn't even know how to protest. How could I say, that's the only thing I have to look forward to? Glenn shoved his hands into his pockets. Robbie stared out the window. Finally, I asked, who are you sending in my place? Glenn glanced at Robbie. Then he said, I'm sending Taylor. You're sending? Taylor? Glenn nodded. She's our next best thing, he said, like that should settle it. It didn't. You're sending my best friend and my boyfriend away and leaving me alone for three weeks. Just days after my mother died. I thought you said you weren't that close. 
I thought you said we were close enough. Look, Glenn said. This is what they call a business decision. But I shook my head. This wasn't going to work. You can't just ground me and dismantle my entire support system. That's my trip. Those are my clients. Glenn sighed. You'll go next time. I want to go this time. Glenn shrugged. I want to win the lottery. But it's not going to happen. Glenn was the kind of guy who believed adversity only made you stronger. I took a minute to breathe. Then I said, if Taylor's going on my trip, where am I going? Nowhere, Glenn said. Nowhere? He nodded. You need to rest. Plus, everywhere's full. He scrolled through his laptop. Jakarta's taken. Colombia's taken. Bahrain. Those oil XX in the Philippines. All taken. But, what am I supposed to do? Glenn shrugged. Help out around the office. I'm serious. But Glenn kept going. Take up knitting. Start a succulent garden. Double down on personal growth. Nope, nope, nope. But Glenn held fast. You need some time off. I hate time off. I don't want time off. It's not about what you want. It's about what you need. What was he, my therapist? I need to work, I said. I do better when I'm working. You can work here. But I also needed to escape. Now I felt a flutter of panic in my throat. Hey. You know me. You know I need to move. I can't just sit here and, and, and marinate in all my misery. I need to be in motion. I need to go somewhere. I'm like a shark, you know? I just always have to be moving. I need to get water through my gills. My hands gestured at my ribcage, as if to show him where my gills were located. If I stay here, I finally said, I'll die. Bullshit, Glenn said. Dying's a lot harder than you think. Glenn hated it when people begged. I begged anyway. Send me somewhere. Anywhere. I need to get out. You can't spend your entire life running away, Glenn said. Yes, I can. I absolutely can. I could tell from his face we'd hit the wall. But I still had some fight left in me. What about the thing in Burkina Faso? I asked. I'm sending Doghouse. I've got three years on Doghouse. But he speaks French. What about the wedding in Nigeria? I'm sending Amadi. He hasn't even been here six months. But his family's from Nigeria. And he speaks. Fine. Forget it. Yoruba and a little bit of Igbo. That was the crux of it. Glenn had a rep to protect. I'll send you, he said like we were done here, when it's a good fit. I'll send you when it's best for the agency. I'll never send you over somebody more qualified. I narrowed my eyes at Glenn in a way that just dared him to fight me. There's nobody more qualified than me, I said. Glenn looked me over, using his well-honed powers of observation like a weapon. Maybe, maybe not, he said at last. But you buried your mother yesterday. I met his eyes. He went on. Your pulse is elevated, your eyes are bloodshot, and your makeup is smeared. Your speech is rapid, and your voice is hoarse. You haven't brushed your hair, your hands are shaking, and you're out of breath. You're a mess. So go home, take a shower, eat some comfort food, grieve the death of your mom, and then figure out some goddamned hobbies, because I guarantee you this, you're sure as hell not going anywhere until you get your shit together. I knew that tone in his voice. I didn't argue. But how, exactly, was I supposed to get back to work if he wouldn't let me get back to work? 2. 
Have I explained what I do for a living? I usually try to put that off as long as possible. Because once you know, once I actually name the profession, you'll make a long list of assumptions about me, and all of them will be wrong. But I guess there's no more avoiding it. My life doesn't make much sense if you don't know what my job is. So here goes, I am an executive protection agent. But nobody ever knows what that is. Let's just say I'm a bodyguard. Lots of people get it wrong and call me a security guard, but to be clear, that's not even remotely what I do. I don't sit in a golf cart in a supermarket parking lot. What I do is elite. It takes years of training. It demands highly specialized skills. It's tough to break into. And it's a strange combination of glamorous, first-class travel, luxury hotels, off-the-charts wealthy people, and utterly mundane, spreadsheets, checklists, counting carpet squares in hotel hallways. Mostly, we protect the very rich, and occasionally famous, from all the people who want to harm them. And we get paid really well to do it. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking I'm five foot five, and female, and nothing even close to brawny. You're conjuring a stereotype of a bodyguard, maybe a club bouncer with skin-tight shirt sleeves squeezing his biceps, and you're noting that I'm pretty much the opposite of that. You're wondering how I could possibly be any good. Let's clear that up. Steroid-inflated bruises are one type of bodyguard, a bodyguard for people who want the whole world to know they have a bodyguard. But the thing is, most people don't. Most clients who need executive protection don't want anyone to know about it. I'm not saying that the big guys don't have value. They can have a deterrent effect. But they can also do the opposite. It all depends on the type of threat, to be honest. Most of the time, you're safer if your protection goes unnoticed. And I am fantastic at going unnoticed. All women EP agents are, which is why we're in high demand. No one ever suspects us. Everyone always thinks we're the nanny. I do the kind of protection most people never even know is happening, even the client. And I'm the least lethal looking person in the world. You'd think I was a kindergarten teacher before you'd ever suspect that I could kill you with a corkscrew. I could kill you with a corkscrew, by the way. Or a ballpoint pen. Or a dinner napkin. But I'm not going to. Because if things ever get to the point where I have to kill you, or anybody else, I haven't done my job. My job is to anticipate harm before it ever materializes, and avoid it. If I have to stab you in the eye with a dinner fork, I've already failed. And I don't fail. Not in my professional life, at least. All to say, my job is not about violence, it's about avoiding violence. It's much more about brains than brawn. It's about preparation, observation, and constant vigilance. It's about predictions, and patterns, and reading the room before you're even in it. It's not just something you do, it's something you are, and my destiny was most likely set in fourth grade, when I was first recruited as a carpool monitor and got a day glow sash and a badge. I still have that badge on my nightstand. Or maybe it was set in seventh grade when we moved into an apartment that was around the corner from a jiu-jitsu studio, and I convinced my mom to let me take classes. Or maybe it was set by all those terrible boyfriends my mother could never stop bringing home. Whatever it was, when I saw a recruiting booth near the campus jobs kiosk during my freshman year of college with a navy and white sign that read Escape to the FBI, it was pretty much a done deal. Escape was my favorite thing. When I tested off the charts on conscientiousness, pattern recognition, observational skills, listening retention, and altruism, they recruited me right up. That is, until Glenn Schultz came along and poached me away. And the rest became history. He taught me everything he knew, I started traveling the world, this job became my entire life, and I never looked back. The point is, I loved it. You have to love it. You have to give it everything. You have to be willing to step in front of a bullet, and that's no small choice, 
because some of these people are not exactly lovable and getting shot hurts. It's high stakes and high stress, and if you're going to do it right, it has to be about something bigger than you. That's really why people who love this job love this job, it's about who you choose over and over every day to be. The luxury travel is pretty great, too. Mostly, it's a lot of work. A lot of paperwork, a lot of advanced site visits, a lot of procedural notes. You have to write everything down. You're constantly on guard. It's not exactly relaxing. But you get addicted. This life makes regular life seem pretty dull. Even the boredom in this job is exciting somehow. You're on the move. You're never still. And you're too busy to be lonely. Which always suited me just fine. That is, until Glenn grounded me in Houston at the very moment when I needed an escape the most. That same day Glenn took me off the Madrid gig, my car wouldn't start and so Robbie wound up driving me home in his vintage Porsche in the pouring rain. Which was fine. Better, actually. Because I still hadn't invited him to Toledo. Maybe it was the rain coming down so hard that the wipers, even on the highest setting, could barely clear it, but it wasn't until we made it to my house that I noticed Robbie had been weirdly quiet on the drive home. It was too wet for me to get out right then, so Robbie turned off the car entirely and we just watched the water coat the windows like we were at a car wash. That's when I turned to him and said, let's go on a trip. Robbie frowned. What? That's why I came to the office today. To invite you on vacation. On vacation where? Now I was regretting the randomness of the choice. How, exactly, do you sell Toledo? With me, I answered, like he'd asked a different question. I don't understand, Robbie said. I've decided to take a vacation, I said, like this isn't hard. And I'd like you come with me. You never take vacations, Robbie said. Well, now I do. I've invited you on three different trips, and you've weaseled out of all of them. That was before. Before what? Before my mother died. Before I got grounded. Before I got taken off Madrid. Before I bought non-refundable tickets to Toledo. Robbie looked me over. Toledo. If he'd been confused before, now he shifted to full-on befuddled. People don't go on vacation to Toledo. Actually, they have world-renowned botanical gardens. But Robbie sighed. There's no way we're going there. Why not? Because you'll cancel. What part of non-refundable don't you understand? You really don't know yourself very well, do you? I don't see the problem, I said. You wanted to do this, and now we're doing it. Can't you just say awesome and accept? I actually can't. His voice had a strange intensity to it. And in the wake of those words, he leaned forward and ran his fingers over the grooves of the steering wheel in a way that got my attention. Did I mention that I read body language the way other people read books? I can speak body language better than English. For real. I could list it on my resume as my native tongue. Growing up as my mother's child had forced me to learn the opposite of language, all the things we say without words. I had turned it into a pretty great career, to be honest. But if you asked me if it was a blessing or a curse, I wouldn't know what to say. Things I read about Robbie in that one second, he wasn't happy. He dreaded what he was about to do. He was doing it anyway. Yep. Got all that from his fingers on the steering wheel. And the tightness in his posture. And the force of the next breath he took. And the tilt of his head. And the way his eyes seemed to be using his lashes like a shield. Why? I asked next. Why can't you accept? Robbie looked down. Then a half breath, a quick clench of the jaw, a stealing of the shoulders. Because, he said, I think we should break up. Impossible, but true, he shocked me. 
I turned to look at the dashboard. It was textured to look like leather. I really hadn't seen that coming. And I always saw everything coming. Robbie kept going. We both know this isn't working. Did we both know that? Does anybody ever know a relationship isn't working? Is that something you can know? Or do all relationships require a certain amount of unreasonable optimism just to survive? I said the only thing I could think of. You're breaking up with me? On the night after my mother's funeral. He acted like I was catching him on a technicality. Is my timing the most important thing here? Your appalling timing? I asked, stalling for my brain to catch up. I don't know. Maybe. Or maybe not, Robbie said. Because don't forget. You weren't even all that close. Just because it was true didn't make it right. That's not relevant, I said. I guess timing really does matter. I'd been sleeping on a hospital sofa for days, up five times a night while my mother retched into a plastic bucket. I'd watched her shrink to a skeleton in that flimsy hospital gown. I'd watched the life that had given me life drain away before my eyes. After that, I'd arranged the funeral. All the details. The music, the food. I'd played host all day to high school friends, co-workers, ex-boyfriends, AA friends, and drinking buddies. I'd ordered the flowers, and zipped the back zipper on my black dress all by myself, and even put together a slideshow. Robbie had it wrong. Because, despite everything, I loved her. I didn't like her, but I loved her. And he'd underestimated me, as well. Because it's so much harder to love someone who's difficult than to love someone who's easy. I was stronger than even I knew. Probably. But I guess I was about to find out. Because as the rain started to ease up, and as I pressed the pads of my fingers to the window glass, I heard myself say, in a soft, uncertain voice that even I barely recognized, I don't want to break up. I love you. You only say that, Robbie said then, his voice tinged with a certainty I'll never forget, because you don't know what love is. Glenn had warned us about this a year ago, back when it all started. As soon as he'd heard the gossip, he called us into the conference room, and shut the door, and lowered the mini blinds. Is this really happening? he demanded. Is what really happening? Robbie asked. But this was the legendary Glenn Schultz. He wasn't falling for that. You tell me. Robbie held his best poker face, so Glenn turned to me. But mine was even better. I'm not going to stop you, Glenn said. But we need a plan in place. For what? Robbie asked, and that was his first mistake. For when you break up, Glenn said. Maybe we won't break up, Robbie said, but Glenn refused to insult us all by responding. Instead, like a man who'd seen it all and then some, he just looked back and forth between the two of us and sighed. It was the rescue assignment, wasn't it? Robbie and I met each other's eyes. Had we fallen for each other in the wake of an assignment to rescue a custody kidnap in Iraq? Had we survived gunfire, a car chase, and a death-defying midnight border crossing only to fall into bed together at the end if for no other reason than to celebrate the fact that we were, against all odds, still alive? And was the adrenaline of that assignment still powering our semi-secret office romance all these months later? Obviously. But we admitted nothing. Glenn had been in this business too long to need something as pedestrian as verbal confirmation. I know better than to interfere, he said. So I'm just going to ask you one question. It's the easiest thing in the world for agents to get together and it's the hardest thing for them to stay together. What are you going to do when it ends? I should have held eye contact. That's negotiations 101. Never look down. But I look down. Really? Glenn said to me, leaning a little closer. You think it's going to last? You think you're going to buy a house with a picket fence and go to the farmer's market on weekends? 
Get a dock? Buy sweaters at the mall? You don't know the future, Robbie said. No, but I know the two of you. Glenn was pretty pissed, and that was not unreasonable. We were his investment, his kids, his favorites, and his retirement portfolio all rolled into one. Glenn rubbed his eyes and when he looked up, he was breathing in that noisy way that had earned him the nickname the Warthog. He stared us down. I can't stop you, he said, and I'm not going to try. But I'll tell you this right now. There'll be no leaving the company when this crashes and burns. You'll get no pity from me, and you won't get a letter of recommendation, either. If you apply somewhere else, I'll torpedo you with the worst reference in the history of time. You're mine. I made you, I own you, and goddammit nobody in this room gets to quit. Not even me. Understood? Understood, we both said, in unison. Now get out of my sight, Glenn said, or I'll send you both to Afghanistan. That was a year ago. It's funny to think how much I'd pitted Glenn's pessimism back then. His third wife had just left him, not uncommon in this job, since you're gone more than your home. I remember mentally shaking my head at him as I walked away from the conversation. I remember thinking that Robbie and I were going to prove him wrong. Smash cut to a year later, Robbie dumping me in the rain, like he was doing us both a favor. It's for the best, he said. You need to grieve, anyway. You don't deserve my grief, I said. I meant your mother. Oh. Her. Huh. Don't tell me what I need. Robbie had the nerve to look wounded. Be civil about this. Why should I? Because we're both adults. Because we know what's at stake. Because we never really liked each other all that much, anyway. That stung like a slap. I met his eyes for the first time and tried not to sound surprised. We didn't, huh? That's fair to say, right? Um, no. That wasn't fair to say. It was incredibly crass. And wrong. And probably a lie, too, a way for Robbie to absolve himself. Sure, he dumped me the day after my mother's funeral, but what did that matter if we never really liked each other all that much, anyway? But fine. Whatever. Though I could think of a hotel room in Costa Rica that might claim otherwise. In the humiliation of that moment, had I really just told a man I loved him while he was breaking up with me, it was as if Robbie wasn't just taking his love away, but all love. That's what it felt like. What can I say? It's hard to think straight in a crisis, and the conclusion I landed on was that my only way to keep going was to get back to work. I didn't need hobbies. I didn't need to learn crochet. I needed to get back to the office and get a new assignment, and win that position running the branch in London. It was as clear as needing air. I needed to do something. Go somewhere. Flee. Now more than ever. But before I could step out of the car into the rain and forget him entirely, there was one question I still had to ask. I looked straight into Robbie's eyes. And then, in a tone like I was just calmly curious, I said, you said things between us aren't working. Why is that again? He nodded, like that was a fair enough question. I've given some thought to that over the past few months. Months? And I've decided, ultimately, it comes down to one thing. Which is? You. My head gave an involuntary shake. Me? Robbie nodded, like saying it out loud had confirmed it. It's you. And then, in a tone like he might even be giving me helpful advice, he said, you have three deal-breaker flaws. The words echoed in my head as I braced for them. Three deal-breaker flaws. One, Robbie said, you work all the time. Okay. He also worked all the time. But fine. Two, Robbie went on, you're not fun, you know. You're so serious every minute. Um. Holy shit. How do you argue with that? 
And three, Robbie said with anticipation, like we were really getting to the clincher, you're a bad kisser. Three. A month later, I was still enraged about it. A bad kisser. A bad kisser. I mean, workaholic. Fine. There's no shame in being fantastic at your job. Not fun. Whatever. Fun was overrated. But a bad kisser. That was the kind of insult that would haunt me to my grave. Unacceptable. Just like the state of my entire life. My mother died. Then I got grounded from my job. Then the longest relationship of my life ended with the most insulting insult in the world. And there was nothing I could do about any of it. My mother stayed dead, my ex-boyfriend and my best friend left for three weeks on my assignment to Madrid, and I stayed home. In Houston. With nothing to do and no one to do it with. It's a blur how I even survived. Mostly, I did anything at all to keep busy. I reorganized the file room at the office. I did local mini assignments. I repainted my bathroom tangerine orange without asking my landlord. I cleaned out my mother's place and listed it for sale. I took six-mile runs after work in hopes of tuckering myself out. I counted the purgatory-like seconds until I could get the hell out of town. Oh, and I slept every night on the floor of my closet. Those four weeks took a thousand years. And in all that time, I can only remember one truly good thing that happened. Going through my mother's jewelry box, I found something I thought was lost, something that would have seemed like junk to anybody else. Buried under a tangled necklace, I found a little silver beaded safety pin that I'd made at school on my eighth birthday. The colors were just like I remembered, red, orange, yellow, pale green, baby blue, violet, white. Beaded friendship pins had been big at school that year, we all made them and pinned them to our shoelaces, and so on the day our teacher brought in pins and beads, we were ecstatic. She let us spend recess making them, and I'd saved my favorite to give to my mom. I loved the idea of surprising her on a day she'd be giving me presents with a present of my own for her. But I never got to give it to her in the end. Somehow, before the next morning, it was gone. In the wake of that day, I'd looked for it for weeks. Checking and double-checking the floor of my closet, the pockets of my backpack, under the hallway rug. It had been one of those long, unsolved mysteries in my life, a question I'd carried for so long, how had I lost something so important? But fast forward twenty years and there it was, safely stashed in my mom's jewelry box, waiting for me like a long-hidden answer. Like she'd been keeping it safe for me the whole time. Like maybe I'd underestimated her a little bit. And myself, too. Right then and there, I'd looked through her necklaces to find a sturdy gold chain, then I'd clipped the beaded pin to it like a pendant. And then I wore it. Every day after that. Like a talisman. I even slept in it. I found myself touching it all the time, spinning the smooth beads under my fingertips to feel their cheery little rattle. Something about it was comforting. It made me feel like maybe things were never quite as lost as they seemed. On the morning when Robbie and Taylor were coming back from Madrid a morning when we were having a meeting in the conference room where Glenn had promised to give me a new assignment, at last I touched that pin so much I wondered if I might wear it out. The point was, I was about to get an assignment. I was about to escape. It didn't matter where I was going. Even just the idea of leaving turned my heart into a rippling field of relief. Now I would disappear from here. And then, for the first time in so long, I would feel okay. All I had to do was survive seeing Robbie again. We're very dismissive, as a culture, about heartbreak. We talk about it like it's funny, or silly, or cute. As if it can be cured by a pint of Hagendazes and a set of flannel pajamas. But of course, a breakup is a type of grief. It's the death of not just any relationship, but the most important one in your life. There's nothing cute about it. Dumped is also a word that falls short of its true meaning. 
It sounds so quick, like a moment in time. But getting dumped lasts forever. Because a person who loved you decided not to love you anymore. Does that ever really go away? As I waited at the table in the conference room, the first person there by a mile, that's what hit me, Robbie leaving had felt like a confirmation of my worst, deepest, most unacknowledged fear. Maybe I just wasn't lovable. I mean, yes, I was a good person. I had many fine qualities. I was competent, and I had a strong moral compass, and let's add, I was a pretty great cook. But how does anybody just ever assume they'd be somebody else's first choice? Was I better than all the other great people in the world? Was I special enough to be the one somebody picked over everybody else? Not for Robbie, I guess. I didn't want to see him again. Or think about it. Or have a self-esteem crisis. I just wanted to get the hell out of Texas. The first person to arrive in the conference room was Taylor. My best friend. Freshly back from Madrid with my ex. Though that wasn't her fault. Her hair was shorter, a little European bob and tucked behind her ears, and she was wearing mascara, which was new, and made her green eyes pop. I squealed at the sight of her and took off running, catapulting myself into her arms. You're back. I said, hugging tight around her neck. She hugged me back. I killed all your houseplants, I said, but that's the price you pay for leaving. You killed my plants. Didn't you see the corpses? On purpose. By accident, I said. A combination of neglect and overattention. That does sound lethal. Taylor gave me that big smile she's famous for. We talked on the phone much more this time than we usually would on assignment. Mostly because I kept crying and calling her. She was good about it, she really was. She let me process and vent and agonize to my heart's content even when I kept waking her up. Seeing her now, I realized how long it had been since I'd asked her about her. How was the trip? I asked. Fine, she said. Not much of an answer. As we sat down, I could not rein in the impulse to lower my voice and say, and how is he? How is who? Taylor asked. A person who rhymes with blobby. Ah, Taylor said, her face tightening a little in a way that made me feel rooted for. I think he's fine. Fine is a thing for you today. It means he's not, not okay. That's a shame. More importantly, she asked. How are you? I've been stuck here for a month, I said. I'm dying. Taylor nodded. Because you need water in your gills. Thank you. I said, like at last. Thank you for believing in my gills. Just then, Glenn walked in. Stop talking about your gills, he said. She's a shark, Taylor said, in my defense. Don't encourage her. Other folks followed him in, and the conference room filled up. Amadi, so ever likable with his round nose and wide smile, was back from Nigeria. Doghouse, back from Burkina Faso, had grown a beard to cover the burned scar on his jaw. Kelly was just back from Dubai with some gold hoop earrings that exactly matched her blonde curls. I tried not to watch the door for Robbie. I maintained good posture. I arranged my face into a pleasant, fine thanks and how are you expression so precisely that my cheek muscles started quivering. I ignored the white noise shearing in my ears. Finally, just as Glenn was clearing his throat to begin, Robbie strolled in. His buzz cut was longer. He wore a new, slim cut suit, a tie I'd never seen, and his famous vionettes even though we were inside. Though he whipped them off just as he entered the room. Damn it. He made it work. He'd always been better at style than at substance. Did it ache to see him? Did it suck all the air out of my chest? Incapacitate me with emotion? Feel like I'd just swigged down a whole bottle of heartbreak? 
No, actually. This is good, I thought. Wait. Was this good? This meant I was over him, right? My endless time in Houston slash purgatory had done the trick. They say time heals all wounds. Was that it? Was I done? Or had the past month just destroyed my ability to feel anything at all? As Glenn revved up the meeting, I held my breath. Please, 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 I found myself thinking. For once, just let me get off easy. Sometimes I wonder if I jinxed myself in that moment. Because when Glenn started the meeting, leading with my new assignment, it hit me pretty fast that it was not going to be the escape I'd been holding my breath for. First things first, Glenn said, as the room quieted, pointing at me. Let's talk about the new assignment for Brooks. Glenn always called me Brooks. I couldn't guarantee he even knew my first name. It's a juicy one, Glenn went on. Outside our normal wheelhouse. Should be pretty absorbing. It's actually a new assignment for everybody in here. Kind of an all-hands-on-deck situation. But Brooks will be the primary. Glenn gave me a little nod. She's earned it. Where is it? I asked. I think what you want to know is who is it? Nope, I said. I definitely want to know where. Because this client, Glenn went on, his voice reminding me of how people talk to their dogs before they give them treats, is really, really famous. We didn't protect a lot of famous people at Glenn Schultz Executive Protection. If we'd been based in LA, that would have been different. But we were based in Houston, so we got mostly oil executives and business people. The occasional entertainer coming through town. I once did some remote location assessments for Dolly Parton, and she sent me a lovely thank you note. But that was about it. I looked at Glenn's face. He was suppressing a smile. He was actually excited. And Glenn never got excited about anything. He went on. This particular assignment happens to take place in the great state of Texas. Texas? I demanded. Glenn ignored me. Just right here in our friendly hometown of Houston, so. Houston? I scooted my chair back. In eight years of receiving assignments, I had never once protested a location. That's just not how this job works. You don't care where you go. You go where they send you. It's fine. But. It had been a rough month. Let's just say I was right on the verge of doing something unprofessional. But then Glenn told us who the principal was. Pulling his lips back into a very pleased with himself smile, as if this good news would cancel out any bad news that might ever happen again, Glenn did his big reveal. The principal for this one, he said, clicking the remote for the whiteboard and flashing a movie poster up for us all to see, is Jack Stapleton. The whole room gasped. Robbie launched into a coughing fit. Kelly let out a shriek like she was at a Beatles concert. And that's when, despite everything I had just decided about how getting myself to London would be the answer to all my problems, I said, you know what? I quit. 4. I don't have to tell you who Jack Stapleton is, of course. You probably gasped, too. My attempt to quit got totally lost in the chaos. I'm not sure anybody even heard me except for Glenn, who brushed that declaration off with a glance, like I was an annoying insect. You're never quitting. Like I already said. I'd been waiting to get out of Texas like a drowning person waiting for a rope. The disappointment of being still stuck here made me feel short of breath. But I'll tell you something. Hearing the name Jack Stapleton didn't not get my attention. Was protecting a two-time, back-to-back sexiest man alive here in Texas better than protecting some grey-toothed, watery-eyed, pear-shaped oil executive somewhere else? Fine. Maybe. Glenn certainly thought so. This one's a doozy folks, Glenn said, getting his groove back. It's a good thing Brooks had time to rest up, 
because this one's gonna keep her busy. I hadn't said yes yet, of course. But, then again, I never said no. Glenn clicked the remote for the digital whiteboard and flashed a red carpet photo of Jack Stapleton, in all his six-foot-three dreaminess, up on the conference room screen. I take it from the collective gasp that we all know who this man is. He started clicking through photos. We did this for every new client, but let's just say that it wasn't normally quite this, engaging. The first few were professional shots, Jack Stapleton in a t-shirt so snug, it looked airbrushed. Jack Stapleton in ripped jeans. Jack Stapleton in a tux with the bow tie undone, staring into the camera like we were all about to follow him to his hotel room. This really is the client? Doghouse asked, double-checking. Obviously, yes. But we all waited to hear it again anyway. Because it was just so unbelievable. Affirmative, Glenn said. Then he looked over at Kelly. Don't you have a thing for him? What am I? Kelly said. A teenager? I feel like I've heard his name come up. Functioning adults do not have things for actors, Kelly declared to the room. That's when Doghouse, right next to her, put a boot up on the conference table and gave Kelly a sly smile. Pretty sure she's got socks with Stapleton's face on them. Those were a gift, Kelly said. But you wear them, Doghouse pointed out. It's weird that you know that. But that just made Doghouse grin bigger. Isn't his picture the home screen on your phone? That's classified. And it's weirder that you know that. The point is, Glenn said, pointing at Kelly as a cautionary tale. Be professional. Anything you own with the client's face on it. Doghouse started counting off examples, t-shirts, tattoos, string bikinis. Get rid of it now, Glenn finished. Kelly flared her nostrils at Doghouse, but he just gave her a wink. But Glenn wasn't here to play. This was a big deal client and a high-profile gig. He clicked ahead to some paparazzi shots, and we saw Jack Stapleton in a plaid shirt shopping at a farmer's market. Jack Stapleton in a baseball cap crossing a parking lot. Jack Stapleton wearing, Holy Mary, sweet mother of God, clingy board shorts at the beach, rising up out of the waves, and glistening like a Roman deity. Taylor spoke for all the women in the room when she let out a long, low whistle. I felt Robbie glance over at the sound, but I didn't look. Kept my eyes on the prize, as it were. Ladies, Glenn said. Let's not objectify the principal. The men around the table murmured in agreement. And just on the heels of that, Glenn clicked to a slide that got the other half of the room whistling. And this, Glenn said, is his girlfriend. It was Kennedy Monroe, of course running Baywatch style along a perfect beach, not even one dimple of visible cellulite, as if she had the ability to live Photoshop herself in real time. Everybody knew they were dating, and gazing up in awe at the whiteboard, it was no mystery why. She had a kind of weaponized beauty that made all its own rules. A couple ever since co-storing in the Destroyers. They'd just been on the cover of People Together. That said, I'd always found it an odd pairing. She was, after all, most famous for the scandal where she falsely claimed to be Marilyn Monroe's granddaughter and got sued by Monroe's estate. And then Jack Stapleton had been quoted in an Esquire interview saying, she's like a conspiracy theorist about herself. Wow. How did I know this much about them without even trying? Kelly seemed to be having the same visceral reaction to her that I was. Will she be here, she asked, nostrils flaring. Nah, Glenn said. Just threw that one in for fun. He clicked up another slide, this one of a guy who looked so much like Jack Stapleton that it made you want to rub your eyes. Is that the principal? Amadi asked, like we were being tricked. It's his older brother, Hank, Glenn explained. Then he brought up a picture of Jack and we studied the two side by side like a find the differences picture game. That's where Glenn paused the slideshow. 
I can't imagine there's a person in this room who hasn't seen the destroyers, he said. And you probably all know the basics of how, right after opening weekend, Jack Stapleton's younger brother Drew was killed in an accident. That was two years ago. Jack stepped out of the public eye, moved to the remote mountains of North Dakota, and hasn't made a movie since. Yes, we all knew that. Everybody in America knew that. Babies knew it. Dogs knew it. Maybe even earthworms. The accident got covered up. I mean, Glenn shook his head with admiration, they did a fantastic job. There are no details anywhere, and I've had Kelly on this all day. We nodded at Kelly. She was the best dirt digger we had. If I'd known why you had me on this, Kelly said, I'd have worked harder. Glenn stayed focused. All you can find anywhere, he went on, are the basics, car accident. Jack and his younger brother were together. Only Jack survived. Glenn flashed a photo of Jack and his brother Drew at some premiere, in suits, smiling for the cameras with their arms around each other. We gave it a moment of silence. Then Glenn went on. But there are rumors. Rumors that Jack was driving and there might have been alcohol involved. Kelly's working to see if she can confirm. Kelly wrinkled her nose and shook her head like it wasn't going well. So Glenn went on. What we do know is that, in the wake of that accident, the family has been estranged. In particular, there seems to be bad blood between Jack and the older brother. There's no reporting we can find that explains the rift. Glenn flashed a photo of the family from before the accident, two sweet-looking parents and three grown boys, a paparazzi photo taken in the stands of a stadium. Also, despite Stapleton's stated intention of retiring from acting, he is still under contract to make the sequel to The Destroyers. He's been fighting in court to break it, and it's unclear at this point who'll prevail, but he hasn't left North Dakota for any voluntary reason since. Until now. He arrives in Houston today. Glenn checked his watch. Landed 23 minutes ago. He finally comes out of hiding, and he picks Houston. Robbie said. Hey, Kelly said, like she was offended. We're not so bad. Robbie shook his head. Nobody comes here on purpose. Glenn seized the meeting back. Jack Stapleton's not coming here on purpose, either. He's from here, Doghouse volunteered, proud to know some trivia. Correct, Glenn said. He's from here. And his parents live on a ranch out past Katie on the Brazos River. And his mother was just diagnosed with breast cancer, and so he's coming home to stay for a while. That's why it's happening so fast, Doghouse said. It was fast. We'd normally take weeks, at least, to get prepped for something like this. Yes, Glenn said. She got her diagnosis on Monday, and her surgery is scheduled for Friday morning. Aggressive protocol, Amadi said. His father was an oncologist. Glenn nodded. From what I understand, it wouldn't be your first choice of cancer. But it's not unbeatable. We all noted the double negative. What's the duration of the assignment? I asked then. Unclear. But it's my understanding that Stapleton intends to stay for the run of her treatment. Weeks? I asked. At least. We'll know more when the family does. It was so strange to think of Jack Stapleton as having a family or as having any kind of life outside of his primary role of giving us all something to ogle about humanity. And yet, there it was. Jack Stapleton was a real person. With a mom. Who was sick. And a hometown. And now he was coming to Houston. Glenn changed the slideshow to a series of photos of a modern, three-story house. He's rented a place in town near the medical center. We couldn't get access until today, but here are some photos from the rental listing. What normal people would have seen in those photos was a brand new, 
high-end, luxurious modern house, with high ceilings and huge windows and lush landscaping. It had a pale blue front door with a potted fiddle-leaf fig plant next to it. It looked like something out of architectural digest. But we all looked at those images through a different lens. The fiddle-leaf fig made for a pretty picture, but it wasn't relevant to anyone in this room. Unless we could hide a security camera in it. The high wall around the yard meant it would be hard for a stalker to scale it. The circular driveway out front was a little too close to the structure. That giant oleander bush would need to be trimmed. The rooftop patio would be easy for a sniper to access. In night shots, the lighting out front was much more about mood than visibility. Glenn walked us through the security features. Security cameras galore, even one interior, motion activated, in the front hall. Top of the line alarm system and high tech locks with remote access. Though the client's representative says he forgets to use it. Red flag. Uncooperative client. I raised my hand. Did he hire us? Or was it, like, his manager or something? Glenn paused. And with that pause, we all knew the answer. A little bit of both, he said. His manager technically hired us. But it's at the strenuous urging of his team. And the studio that's about to make the Destroyer sequel. It was not uncommon for our clients to have teams. Why is the team strenuously urging him to hire security? I asked. He's had some stalkers in the past, Glenn said, and one of them lives here in town. The table gave a collective nod. So the first strategy, of course, is to conceal the fact that he's here at all for as long as possible. But that's a wild card. He is widely recognizable. Kelly let out a ha. But, Glenn went on, he's been off the grid for a while, so he might not be in the forefront of people's minds. And he does seem to avoid the spotlight pretty well these days. That was good. The less spotlight, the better. He has indicated that he'll accompany his mother to her surgery and appointments. Other than that, he plans to lie pretty low. I was trying to remain uncommitted, but my brain was already starting to churn and work out the strategy. We'd need to get the hospital architectural plans. Do a site visit in advance. Find the best ingress and egress options. Secure a private waiting area. What's the situation on the former stalker? Doghouse asked. Glenn nodded and pulled up a photo. A mugshot of a middle-aged woman with no-nonsense hair, pale pink lipstick outside the lines, and, most notably, wearing earring bobs with Jack's face on them. Don't you have those earrings? Doghouse said to Kelly. She flung her ballpoint pen at him, next to her. When it clattered down to the table, she took it back. We all relaxed. A female stalker was a good thing. Women didn't tend to kill people. A lot of activity in the two years before the destroyers came out, Glenn said, but less since the brother died and Stapleton went off the grid. Glenn put up a list on the screen and gestured at it. In five years, she sent hundreds of letters, some of them threatening. Lots of online harassment, too, most of it trying to frighten him into dating her. Oldest trick in the book, I said. I heard Robbie laugh at that. Glenn went on. She took trips to LA and found his house. He woke up one morning and discovered her asleep in his bathtub, clutching a doll with a photo of his face taped onto it. So, standard lady stalker stuff, Taylor said. Correct, Glenn nodded. She's done everything from knitting him sweaters to threatening suicide if he didn't impregnate her. Isn't she kind of, past childbearing age? Not according to her. Any death threats? Amadi asked. Not that we know of. Not from her, anyway. 
There was a recent series of unhinged insults on a fan site from a username, Glenn checked his notes, Wilbur hates you 321. We're keeping an eye on it. Guess we know how Wilbur feels, Kelly said. Why does the name Wilbur just not seem threatening? Taylor asked. Because, I answered, Wilbur's the pig in Charlotte's web. Oh, Kelly said. Ladies, Glenn said. Focus, please. If you wanted us to focus, Kelly said, you shouldn't have kicked things off with that beefcake slideshow. They're drunk on hormones, Doghouse said. Kelly elbowed him. You wish. The briefing was far more brief than usual because we'd only just gotten the case. Catching up and doing all our normal due diligence would be a scramble. Glenn broke us into teams to get to work. Glenn assigned Robbie to analyze Jack's media coverage, including his Instagram, to find out how much of his personal information was out there. He assigned Doghouse to do a physical assessment on the rental house in town, including architectural plans and features, crime info on the neighborhood, and a deep dive into the security system. He told Amadi to gather everything he could on the parents' ranch. He assigned Kelly to compile a dossier on the recently hired housekeeper, and Taylor to create a comprehensive portfolio on all past stalker activity. And me? Glenn tried to send me to the beauty parlor. What the hell? I said, right there in the meeting. You're the primary on this one, Brooks. You need to look the part. First of all, I said, I haven't agreed to be the primary. Glenn flared his nostrils. You will. I looked down at my suit. I looked fine. Didn't I? Glenn went on. If you needed a backer, we'd get you a backer, and if you needed a sari, we'd get you a sari, so since you are headed to the fancy rente mansion of a Hollywood A-lister, we're getting you a makeover. I don't need a makeover, I said, but then I regretted it right away. The whole room burst out laughing. You're going to shadow Jack Stapleton like that. Robbie said. I touched my plain brown hair, which was already falling out of its low bun, and then glanced down at my outlet mall and tailor pantsuit. Maybe, I said. On assignment, I wore whatever blending in required. I'd worn everything from little black dresses, to leather jackets, to tennis outfits. I dressed like a teenager, like a punk rocker, and like a frumpy school mom. I was happy to be incognito. I'd do anything to play the part right. But no matter what I wore on assignment, I always returned to my set point of the entailer pantsuit, with flats, not heels, because you always have to be able to run. Footwear really is crucial. I was still reacting to the makeover idea when Robbie said to Glenn, you should give this gig to Kelly. Kelly shrieked with delight at the idea even though Robbie had zero authority to make that call. Glenn was not a fan of being challenged. He turned to Robbie. What was that? Robbie flicked a glance in my direction, so we all knew exactly who he was talking about. She's not right for it. That's not up to you. Robbie gave a half shrug and said, just saying. And before I had time to even consider if he maybe had a good point, he kept going. Just look at her, he said. She can't pass in that world. Jesus, Robbie. Was this how he was going to compete for the London thing? By sabotaging me. But I shifted my attention from Robbie's petulant face, which suddenly seemed so much more punchable than I'd ever noticed before, and panned to the right until I landed on Glenn. You're saying I'm the primary on this whether I like it or not? That's exactly what I'm saying. Why? Because if you want to have a chance at the London job, you need to do it, and do it right. If you don't knock this assignment out of the park, then Robbie's going to London, and you're staying right here in Texas on office duty forever. He held my gaze in a little mini standoff. Then he added, you should be thanking me. I'll pass on that. You're doing this, 
Glenn said. And you don't get to complain, or dial it in, or feel victimized, or pout because life is unfair. Life is unfair. That's not news. I know exactly what Robbie did to you, and I know this isn't exactly the escape you were looking for. It's not an escape at all, I interrupted. But this is the best opportunity you've got. So you're making the most of it. And that starts with a new goddamned wardrobe so you're not standing next to the sexiest man alive looking like a sad temp who needs a shower. Did he think I'd be cowed by insults? I ate insults for breakfast. I squared my shoulders. Why are you making me prove myself when you already know what I'm capable of? I know what the old you was capable of. This you? I'm still not sure. Fine. I thought. I wasn't entirely sure, either. Was it everything I wanted? No. But was it something? And was I desperate enough to do anything? Fine, I said. Fine what? Fine, I'll make the most of it. Glenn looked at me over his reading glasses. Damn right, you will. But, I added, lifting both my eyebrows and pausing so he'd know exactly where I drew the line. There's no way I'm doing a frigging makeover. I want Tio tell you that I was a very cool person who was not flustered by fame. Taylor had once run into Tom Holland at a bar in LA, and she'd lit a cigarette for his friend with a Zippo lighter like a badass. No big deal. I would not have been so chill. Reviewing Jack Stapleton's file, I had to admit, to myself if no one else, I was the opposite of chill. On paper, he was no different than any other client. He had a bank, and credit cards, just like everybody else. He had two cars back in North Dakota, a vintage Wagoneer and a pickup truck, but he'd leased a Range Rover for his time in Houston. He'd had asthma as a child, and he had a current prescription for sleeping pills. Under known enemies he had several pages of crazed fans who'd appeared and disappeared over the years, but that was about it. Under known associates lovers, it listed Kennedy Monroe, and somebody, probably Doghouse, had written in Hubba Hubba by her name. No surprise there. A normal file. A normal file, damn it. Fine. Okay. I was not unaware of Jack Stapleton's charm. I mean, I wasn't a fangirl like Kelly. I didn't have the man's face on my socks. But I'd seen most of his movies except for Fear of the Dark, which was a slasher film and not my thing. I'd also skipped Train to Providence because I heard he sacrificed himself to the zombies in the end, and why would I want to see that? But I'd seen all the others, including the unhoneymooners so many times I'd accidentally memoized the scene where he confesses, it's so exhausting pretending to hate you. His dramatic work in A Spark of Light was tragically underrated. And even though You Wish was widely panned for including every single rom-com trope in history, including, of all things, a mad dash to the airport, they still did those tropes really well, and so it was one of my perennial go-tos when I was feeling down. Also, the way he kissed Katie Palmer and can't win for losing. Oscar worthy. Why wasn't there an Oscar category for best kiss? He should go down in history for that one kiss alone. The first time I saw it, it just about killed me. Like, I almost died from delight. So it was not not a big deal that I'd just been assigned to protect him. Note the double negative. He was not not on my radar. I was not not affected by the thought of him. I'd never have admitted it least of all to myself, but I did of what you could describe as a perfectly normal, non-pathetic, comfortingly mild, not at all creepy little crush on him. You know, in the way you might have a crush on the captain of the football team in high school. You're not going to date the captain of the football team. You know your place and your place is, a scribe for student government. A student liaison for community service. Vice president of the spreadsheet club. It's just a little sunny place for your fantasies to wander. Sometimes. Occasionally. In between your many other more important things to do. No harm in that, right? 
wasn't that ultimately what movie stars were for? To be fantasies for the rest of us? To add imaginary sprinkles to the metaphorical cupcake of life? But now the reality was going to collide with the fantasy. It was the reason I wanted to say no. I liked the fantasy. I didn't want Jack Stapleton to become real. Plus, how could you protect a person who made you nervous? How could you stay focused with an actual god living among humans just feet away from you? Glenn had a professional rep to protect, but so did I. I was supposed to impress the hell out of Glenn if I wanted the London job, but what was I going to do if Jack Stapleton showed up one day in that same navy and cornflower blue baseball tee he'd worn in The Optimist? Good God. I might as well just quit now. I'd seen Jack Stapleton kiss fictional people, bury a fictional father, beg for fictional forgiveness, and sob fictional tears. I'd seen him take a shower, brush his teeth, curl up under the covers at bedtime. I'd seen him rappel down a cliff face. I'd seen him hug his lost then found child. I'd seen him scared, and nervous, and angry, and even naked in bed with the love of his life. None of it was real, of course. I knew that. I mean, I wasn't crazy. It wasn't real, but it seemed real. It felt real. I already cared about him, is what I'm saying. That distance you always maintain with your clients. He had already breached it even though I'd never even met him. Plus, there was just something about Jack Stapleton that I liked. The shape of his eyes, kind of sweet and smiley. The deadpan way he delivered his lines. The way he gazed at the women he loved. Oh, it was going to be a long assignment. But and here came the pep talk, not impossible. The guy on screen wouldn't be the same person in real life. Couldn't be. The guy on screen said funny things because funny writers wrote his lines. The guy on the screen looked picture perfect because the production department styled his hair and put his makeup on and chose his clothes. And the washboard stomach. You don't get those for free. He probably spent hours and hours maintaining that thing. Hours that would have been far better spent, say, fighting poverty, or rescuing homeless pets, or, I don't know, reading a book. Maybe, if there was mercy in the universe, he'd be nothing like I always imagined. Maybe he'd be as unlikable as most of my clients were. Unlikable might help. But I'd also take dumb. Rude. Slug-like. Pompous. Narcissistic. Anything that could demote him to an ordinary, real, mildly irritating person like everybody else, and let me get my work done. I mean, sure. I'd have preferred to keep the fantasy. But reality had its uses, too. 5. Cut Tio, Emmy ringing Jack Stapleton's fancy doorbell in the museum district. In my standard pantsuit. Without the makeover I had so valiantly refused. Kind of regretting that victory now. This was an intake meeting, and I'd done dozens of them. Usually, the whole team went, primaries and secondaries, to meet in person and gather information. But the team was scrambling too hard right now to take the time. So, today, just me. Alone, and talking myself through the moment. You got this. Once you learn to look at the world from a perspective of personal security, you can't look at it any other way. I couldn't walk into a restaurant, for example, without assessing the threat level in the room even when I was off duty. I couldn't not notice suspicious people, or vehicles that circled the block more than once, or empty vans in parking lots, or repair crews that may or may not have been doing surveillance. Honestly, I couldn't get into my car without a three-step process, checking for signs of entry, checking the tailpipe for blockages, and checking under the chassis for explosives. In eight years, I'd never once just walked out to my car and gotten in. I must have seemed like the craziest person ever. But once you know how terrible the world is, you can't unknow. No matter how much you might want to. I wasn't sure exactly how much Jack Stapleton knew about the world, 
but part of my job today, and going forward, was to educate him. You absolutely have to get buy-in from the principal, because you really can't do it alone. Making it clear that protection is necessary without freaking anyone out is a crucial task at the beginning. You have to calibrate exactly how much clients can handle. Arriving at Jack Stapleton's door, I clutched a checklist of things to cover so that he could hold up his end of the safety bargain. I also had some basic in-person tasks that his assistant in LA couldn't do for him, fingerprints, a blood draw, a handwriting sample. Plus, a list of questions that Glenn called the VPQ very personal questionnaire that gathered info on tattoos, moles, fears, weird habits, and phobias. Normally, we'd do a video recording, too, but, obviously, for this guy, no need. Anyway, that was all I had to do. Stick to the script. But wow, did I feel nervous. And that was before he shocked the hell out of me by opening the door. Shirtless. Just opened up the front door. To a total stranger. Utterly naked from the waist up. What kind of a power move was that? Jesus Christ. I said, spinning around and covering my eyes. Put some clothes on. But the image of him was already burned into my retinas, bare feet. Frayed Levi's. A corded leather necklace encircling the base of his neck, just above his collarbones. And I don't even have words for what was happening in the midsection. I squeezed my eyes tighter. How the hell was I supposed to work with that? Sorry, he said, behind me in the doorway. Timed that wrong. Then, it's safe now. I made myself drop my hand and turn back around. Where I beheld Jack Stapleton halfway through the process of wriggling into a t-shirt, six-pack muscles undulating like they wanted to put me in a trance. Let me just stop the clock right here for a second, because it's not every day you stand in Jack Stapleton's doorway, squinting directly into his magnificence, while he does a completely normal yet utterly astonishing thing, like put on a t-shirt. What was it like, you must be wondering, for me to live through that moment? Maybe this will help, my brain shut down. Like, I lost the power of speech. I know he asked me a question somewhere in there. But I cannot tell you what it was. Nor could I answer him. I just stood there, gaping, like a wide mouth base. He's just a person, you're thinking. Just a person who happens to be famous. Sure. Fine. But you try stepping into that moment and not just falling mute with awe. I dare you. Can I also just add that I really hadn't expected him to answer the door at all? I assumed it would be an assistant, or a secretary, or a posh British butler in a morning coat and tails anyone but the man himself. Add to that, he was bigger than he looked. And he looked pretty big to start with. I felt really tiny, in comparison. Which was not my favorite power dynamic. And I'll add, and maybe this goes without saying, he was, alive. As opposed to a celluloid representation of himself. He was a living, breathing, three-dimensional creature. Which was new. I was getting a good look now, and he wasn't nearly as buff as he had been in the destroyers, and of course not right, because who can keep a five-hour A-day workout regimen going indefinitely? So instead of witnessing a jacked-up, bemuscled he-beast, I got a slightly less defined, more subtle yet somehow more sophisticated, ordinary, everyday washboard stomach. A washboard stomach that didn't have to try too hard. Which made him seem more human. Which should have been a good thing. But more human made him more real. And he wasn't supposed to be real. The real Jack Stapleton was less tan than his movie posters. The real him had irises that were more grey than blue. The real him had a little nick where he'd cut himself shaving. His lips looked a bit dry, like they needed some chapstick. His hair was shaggier than I'd ever seen, how long since he'd had a haircut, 
and flopping over his forehead in a way that just begged somebody to brush it off to the side. He had a band-aid on the back of his hand, and he wore a beat-up drugstore sports watch, and he had glasses on, of all things. Not cool guy Prada glasses, just the kind of slightly bent glasses that regular people actually wear for seeing. That's how I knew I wasn't dreaming, by the way. Because it never would have occurred to me to put a bent pair of ordinary glasses on Jack Stapleton. And they somehow made him look both better and worse. Exhausting. Okay, let's start the moment back up. Where were we? Oh, yeah. Holy shit. Friends and neighbors, I just met Jack Stapleton. Barefoot. In Levi's. Wearing a leather necklace that made me redefine all my opinions about leather necklaces. You're early, he said then, interrupting my ogle. I was just getting dressed. I was still mute. I opened my mouth, but nothing came out. I could hear myself wanting to say, I am exactly on time, in a professional, even imperceptibly irritated voice, but I couldn't actually orchestrate the required squeezing of the diaphragm to make it happen. Using every ounce of willpower I had, I ratcheted my open mouth closed. That was something, at least. He frowned at this for a second, and then he said, wait. Are you early? Or am I late? He checked his watch. You know what? I'm still on mountain time. All I could do was not gape. Are you thinking that North Dakota is central time? No response, but I did maintain eye contact. He went on. Because I get that a lot. North Dakota is central time, mostly. Except for the southwest corner where I happen to live. He was unfazed by one-sided conversations. This must happen to him a lot. But now he turned and waved for me to follow. Come on in, he said, heading farther back into the house. I closed the door behind me and trailed him to the kitchen. Get a grip, I scolded myself. He's just a person. He cut himself shaving. He's not even all that tan anymore. Cool pin necklace, by the way, he called back as he walked. Like a reflex, I touched my beaded safety pin. Ha! Huh. Observant. And the pin must have been even more of a talisman than I'd realized, because only then did I magically remember how to talk. Thank you, I said, though it came out more like a question than a reply. In the kitchen, Jack Stapleton bent down and started rummaging through the cabinet under the sink, like regular people sometimes do. Imagine that. They're just like us. I'm new here, he was saying, as I watched, so I don't really know what we have, but just let me know anything you need, and I'll get it for you. He turned and stood up then with a caddy full of cleaning bottles, scrub brushes, sponges, and trash bags, which he set decisively on the counter in front of me. I frowned at him. For cleaning, he said. I shook my head. He frowned again. Aren't you the... And then, so newly grateful for the power of speech, I answered with, executive protection agent. Just as he said, cleaning lady? Really? Here I am in my best pantsuit, and his thinking cleaning lady? Maybe Robbie was right. Maybe I couldn't pass. I am not the cleaning lady, I said. He frowned. Oh. And then he waited, like who are you, then? I'm the primary executive protection agent on your personal security team. He really looked baffled. You're the what on my what? I sighed. I'm in charge of your security detail. I don't have a security detail. Well, this was new. Pretty sure you do. At that, he clamped his hand around my arm just above the elbow, not so hard that it hurt, but hard enough that I couldn't mistake the strength of the grip, and he led me back out the front door. In truth, it's a grip I knew how to get out of, but I was so befuddled by what was happening, I just followed like a lamb. Outside, he closed the door behind us and locked it. Then, 
he got back to business. You're telling me you're not the housekeeper. Do I look like the housekeeper? Jack Stapleton shrugged, like why not? I should have let it go. How many housekeepers show up for work in a silk blouse? Maybe you were planning to change. Okay. Done with that. I gave a sharp sigh. I am not the housekeeper. That's when he held up his finger, like just a sec, turned, and walked down the driveway digging his cell phone out of his pocket. After a few steps, I heard him say, hey. A person just showed up here claiming to be personal security. Wait. Was he suspicious of me? I couldn't hear the response. But I could hear Jack Stapleton loud and clear. We decided against that already. Twice. He was kicking the crushed gravel on the driveway. But that was years ago. A pause. It won't work. It'll be a disaster. There has to be another way. Another pause. Jack Stapleton and whoever he was talking to, his manager, his agent, his guru, went round and round. I don't know if he didn't realize that I could hear him, or if he didn't care, but he vociferously protested my presence in his life, right within earshot. It stung a little. To be honest. He argued for so long that I finally sat down on the little bench near the potted fiddle leaf fig, noting that it could be used to smash the window behind it and should be moved, or sold, or thrown away. With nothing else to do, I half-heartedly assessed the property, distance from the street, adequate, lack of driveway gate, suboptimal, potential skull damage from one of those landscaping rocks, lethal, more out of habit than anything else. Had I ever shown up for an intake meeting with a client who didn't even know he'd hired me? No. This was a first. It was unsettling to think that he didn't even want me there. Most people were at least somewhat grateful for your help. By the time he was finished arguing, fifteen minutes had gone by. He walked back, looking angry a facial expression that, weirdly, I already recognized. I'd seen that face in something for nothing, right after the drug dealers confronted him. I'd also seen it in The Optimist, after he got cheated out of winning the cooking contest. I'd just met this man, but I already knew the funny little dimple that inevitably appeared on his chin when he was really pissed off. And there it was. As I stood up, I was not UN, pissed off myself. We could have been done by now. I could have been home and already punched out for the day. Did you not know they were hiring us? I asked, as he got close. I just thought we'd decided against it, he said. Guess not, I said. I mean, Jack said, I did decide against it. But the studio decided for it. I thought you wanted out of that contract. I do, he said. But what you want and what you get aren't really the same thing. Not untrue. Anyway, their lawyers want them to protect their assets. Is that what you are? Jack nodded. Absolutely. They don't want trouble. And they do want me to stay alive. I'm sure everybody wants that, I said. Not everybody, he said. Isn't that why you're here? True enough. As I nodded, Jack Stapleton really looked at me for the first time since I'd arrived, his new housekeeper slash bodyguard. I felt his gaze like a physical sensation, like sun rays on my skin. I'd looked at him so many times. It was unbelievably weird for him to actually look back. He let out a long, defeated sigh. Let's talk inside. Inside, as his anger dimple will testify, he stayed pissed for a while. Though I hoped it was more at the studio than at me. We sat at his dining table, and I unclutched the accordion folder I'd been holding to my chest since I got there. It felt strangely naked to release it. Jack Stapleton was now slumped in defeat on a dining chair. Just do what you normally do, he said. I took a breath. Okay. What I normally do. This was better. 
We were back in my wheelhouse. I'm Hannah Brooks, I began. I've protected dozens of people in every type of situation imaginable. This was an introductory paragraph I'd memorized. I used it the same way, every time, when I met new clients. It was comforting to recite it, like singing an old favorite song. Executive protection is a partnership, I went on. We're here to help you, and you're here to help us. What you need from us is competence and experienced guidance, and what we need from you is honesty and compliance. Jack Stapleton wasn't looking at me. He was checking his texts. Are you texting right now? I paused to ask. I can do both, he said, not looking up. Um. Not really. But okay. Nothing to do but keep talking. As I remembered who I was, I gained momentum. I pushed the handout I'd brought for him across the table. Printed on the cover page was our guiding principle. I recited it out loud. The object of personal security is to reduce the risk of criminal acts, kidnapping, and assassination against a principal through the application of targeted procedures to normal daily life. Jack Stapleton looked up. Assassination? Really? I've got a 50-year-old stalker who breeds show corgis. But he couldn't derail me now. Constant awareness is the cornerstone of good personal security, I went on. In addition, security measures must always match the threat. Based on our level of knowledge at current, your threat level is relatively low. Of the four levels, white, yellow, orange, and red, we presently list you at yellow. But we expect the news of your visit to Houston to break at some point, and when it does, we'll up your classification to orange. The strategy is to have systems in place to make that transition quickly. Jack Stapleton frowned. This was a lot of high-level jargon coming from the cleaning lady. I went on. All security is a compromise between the demands of the threat level and the reasonable hopes of the client to live a somewhat normal life. I gave up on normal life years ago. We'd like you to read this guidance carefully and familiarize yourself with your responsibilities toward your own safety. Anything you can do to prevent yourself from being successfully targeted helps us all keep you safe. Again, Jack said, this lady mostly knits Christmas sweaters with my face on them. They're actually kind of impressive. I stood up a little taller. All successful kidnappings and assassinations happen because of one final factor and one final factor only, the element of surprise. I'm really not worried about being assassinated. And so the number one thing we need from any protected figure is awareness. Most people sleepwalk through their lives, barely cognizant of the dangers everywhere. But people under threat don't have that luxury. You must train yourself to notice the people and objects around you, and to question them. You're kind of like a talking textbook, did you know that? I've worked for Glenn Schultz for eight years and made my way to the highest rungs of his organization. I have a PPO certificate, as well as advanced training in counter-surveillance, evasive driving, emergency medicine, advanced firearms, and close combat. But if I do my job right, we'll never need any of that. You and I and the team, working together, will anticipate threats and defuse them long before any crisis occurs. I think I liked you better as the maid. I met his eyes. You won't say that at threat level orange. He looked away. I took a breath. I can sense from your body language that you're not too interested in reading the handout, so I'll summarize the most important guidelines for VIPs. I ticked off the list on my fingers, going faster than necessary, just to show off. Times don't meet with strangers at unknown locations. Times don't book restaurants in your own name. Times don't travel at night. Times don't frequent the same clubs and restaurants. Times walk in groups whenever possible. Times don't drive a distinctive vehicle. Times alert the police to any new threats. Times keep your gas tank at least half full at all times. 
Times always keep your car doors locked. Times avoid stopping at traffic lights by pacing your speed. Times establish special code words to indicate all is okay. There was more, but he was smiling at something on his Instagram. I stopped talking and waited for him to notice. After a long pause, he looked up. What was that last one? I quoted myself, establish a code word to indicate all is okay. What's the code word? I decided on the spot. The code word is ladybug. Jack dropped his shoulders. Could we do something a little more badass? Maybe cobra? Or beast mode? The client doesn't get to choose the code word. Clients chose the code words all the time. But that's what you get for texting while I'm talking. Jack frowned. How am I supposed to remember all those rules? He asked next. Read the handbook, I said. Many times. With a highlighter. It's possible my tone was a little sanctimonious. Jack set down his phone with a sigh. Look, he said. I won't be going to clubs or restaurants or meeting with strangers at unknown locations. I'll just be staying home or going with my mother to her doctor's appointments. He sighed. I will also, under duress, make a few trips out to my parents' ranch, but God willing, those visits will be short and rare. And that's it. I'm not here to have fun, or make trouble, or get assassinated. I'm just here to be a good son and help out my mom. Great, I said. That makes our job easier. He started to pick his phone back up. I added, I just need to collect fingerprints, a handwriting sample, and a vial of blood, and we can call it a day. I was forgetting the very personal questionnaire. But I was doing pretty well, all things considered. A vial of blood, he asked. I nodded. I'm trained in phlebotomy. Then I glanced down at his forearms. And you've got veins like fire hoses, anyway. He put his arms behind his back. What do you need blood for? Basic blood work. And to confirm your type. Now he was blinking in disbelief. I enjoyed shocking him a little. This was way better than being the maid. Your assistant filled in your blood type on the form as AB negative, I said, and, if that's confirmed, you're lucky, because that's my blood type, too. Why does that make me lucky? We always like to keep at least one person on the team who can act as a donor for our principal, I said, pulling out the rubber tourniquet and snapping it. So you might have just met your own personal blood bank. 6. Ten minutes later, I had everything I needed, and I was packing up my stuff, more than ready to get out of there. There was something so exhausting about all that handsomeness. Seriously. It was unabated. It was relentless. It was gruelling. And I wasn't even looking at him. He was looking at me. Finally, I paused to look back. What? You're nothing like I thought you'd be, he said. I gave him a look. Right back at you. I expected you to be bigger, for one, he said. You didn't even know I was coming. Today, I didn't know. We were planning to hire you before, though. Then I changed my mind. And then the studio changed it back. Something like that. Jack was still assessing me, and I can't begin to describe how strange it was to be the watchy rather than the watcher. He went on, I guess I thought you'd be more of a tough guy. I was not a tough guy. I was the opposite of a tough guy. But I wasn't telling him that. Nothing about this job requires you to be a tough guy. What does it require? Focus. Training. Awareness. I tapped my head like I was pointing to my brain. It's not about being tough. It's about being prepared. But a bodyguard, you know? I just feel like you should be larger. You're, like, tiny. 
I am hardly tiny, I said. You just happen to be enormous. What are you? 5'4"? I am 5'6", thank you. I was 5'5". Five five. So what would you do if some massive guy tried to beat me up? That would never happen, I said. We'd anticipate the threat and remove you from the scene before it ever came to that. But what if it did? It wouldn't. But just, hypothetically. I sighed. Fine. Hypothetically, if it did, which it wouldn't, I would just, take him down. But how? I've done jiu-jitsu since I was six, and I'm a second-degree black belt. But what if he was really big? Jack lifted up his arms like a bear. I squinted at him. I don't think you understand how jiu-jitsu works. He squinted back. You don't believe me? I asked. Do you realize how sexist that is? It's not sexist. He protested. It's just, physics. How does somebody your size take down somebody my size? That's not physics, I said. That's ignorance. Show me, he said. What? Jiu-jitsu me. No. Yes. I sighed. You want me to take you down? Right now? I mean, not really. But I do think I'd sleep easier if I knew for a fact that you could. You're saying you want me to hurt you? For real? Because if I do what you're suggesting, I'll definitely knock the wind out of you and possibly dislocate your shoulder, too. This was a genuinely bad idea. But I guess Jack did want me to hurt him, because he grabbed my hand and dragged me out his back door, across the patio, to a patch of grass by the pool. Bad idea, bad idea, bad idea, I said, as he tugged me behind him. See how easy it is for me to manhandle you, though, he called back. And I guess that's when I gave in. I was never a big fan of being underestimated. Especially by a guy who thought I was the cleaning lady. He wanted me to hurt him. Fine. I'd hurt him. When we reached the grass, he let go of my hand and jogged off a little further. Then he U-turned and came back at me, launching into a run. I guess we were doing this. Sigh. By this point, there was no decision to make. Once a six-foot-three guy starts running straight for you, there are no decisions left. You just do what you're trained to do. As soon as he reached me, I grabbed his left wrist with both hands, yanked it down, and rammed my hips into his. The trick here is to get a rolling motion. You're pulling his arm and shoulders down while you're shoving his lower half up and then forcing a roll over the pommel of your butt. It sounds more complex than it is. To sum up, you tuck your head, and over he goes. That's physics. In less than a second, he was flat on his back. Moaning. You asked for it, buddy, I said. As I stared down at him, his eyes found mine. And then, for the first time since I'd been there, he smiled. A big admiration-saturated smile. Oh God, that hurts, he said. I told you, I said. He cradled an arm around his midsection, panting. Or wait, was he laughing? You're such a tough guy. I'm really not. You're awesome, he said. That was never in question. Next, he flattened out and spread his arms wide, staring up at the sky. Thank you, Hannah Brooks. Thank you. Why on earth was he thanking me? Then he shouted at the clouds. You're hired. But I refused to be amazed with him about something I'd done a thousand times. It wasn't amazing. It was just training. I was already hired, I said. You're hired again. You're double hired. You're hired with great fanfare. I shook my head and walked back inside to get him some ice. When he made it to the kitchen minutes later, still panting, still aglow with appreciation, he looked, 
shall we say, like he'd just learned a vital life lesson. I secured an ice pack to his shoulder with tied together dish towels, refusing to be flustered, now, in a slower moment, by the proximity of his body to mine. Your shoulder's really going to hurt for a few days, I said. Worth it, he said. Take some ibuprofen before bed. Okay, doc. And next time I tell you I'm good at something, I said, don't make me hurt you to prove it. Roger that. I gathered up my stuff and then turned to say goodbye, clutching my folder of paperwork to my chest like I had before, but feeling like a whole new version of the girl who'd walked in here. Nothing like flipping a man on his back to bolster your self-esteem. Recommend. So it looks like we start in earnest tomorrow, I said, checking the tentative schedule Glenn had given me. You want to drive out to your parents' place in the morning, right? Jack nodded. We've got a team assessing the route right now, I said. This is much more rushed than our normal prep time, but we're just going to fake it till we make it. Jack was looking down. He didn't answer. We can bring a remote team with us tomorrow, and they can assess the ranch property while we're out there, get some cameras installed, evaluate the layout. That felt like a good plan. But then Jack said, actually, that can't happen. I shook my head. What can't happen? We can't take a security team out to my parents' place. Why not? I asked. He took a deep breath. Because my parents can't know anything about this. Anything about what? He gestured around, like all of it. Threats, stalkers, personal security. How is that supposed to work? He shook his head. My mom's sick, you know? She's sick. And if she knows about this, she'll worry. Even though there's really nothing to worry about. I've had stalkers for years, I'm totally immune to all that by now. But I've never told her about anything scary, and I'm sure as hell not starting the week she has surgery for cancer. But. I said. Then I wasn't sure what to say. She's a warrior, Jack said. Like, a world champion warrior. And she's facing some test results that are, not great. And ever since my brother died. Jack stared at his hands like he didn't know how to finish that sentence. For me, I admit a bodyguard is a good thing. I get it. But for my mom. Not good. I was reading up on treatments online and stress can really impact people's outcomes. I can't make things harder than they already are on her. The only way to do this is to make sure my parents never know who you are. But, how? Your website says outside-the-box solutions for every scenario. He turned his phone toward me to show me the website for proof. That's what you've been doing on your phone? I demanded. Jack shrugged. It's one of the things I've been doing on my phone. I gave him a look. The web designer wrote that. Your boss, what's his name? Frank Johnson. Not even close. Glenn Schultz. He says much of the surveillance can be done remotely. Did Glenn already know about this and not tell me? Jack went on. He says you can stay close to me and a second group can monitor from afar. But if you're toting an agent along everywhere you go, won't that kind of tip your family off? Not at all. I put my hands on my hips. Why not? First, Jack said, my parents are sweet and impossibly gullible. And my big brother barely speaks to me. Second, you don't look anything like a bodyguard. He tilted his head a little and gave me his most heart-melting smile. And last but not least, he said. We're going to tell them you're my girlfriend. Back at the office, Glenn was still in the conference room, and half the team was there with him. It was all hands on deck to get this Jack Stapleton project going. I didn't care. Nope, I said to Glenn, charging right up to the head of the conference table. That's a hundred percent nope. 
Glenn didn't even look up. Are we talking about the girlfriend thing? Is there anything else to talk about? It's not a deal breaker. We've done weirder things for clients. You've done weirder things for clients, I said. You've seen the man. Would it really be so awful? I can't believe you knew, and you didn't tell me. I thought it might be better coming from his own famously handsome mouth. Well, it wasn't better. It was worse. I was totally unprepared. I have never walked out of a client's house like that. That's on you. No, it's on you. You didn't warn me. He kept his voice reasonable. I didn't warn you because it's not nearly as big a deal as you're acting like it is. His threat level is mild. He's been off the radar. The press doesn't know he's here. The money's good. This is the definition of easy. You be his girlfriend then. I said. Glenn flared his nostrils. Or anybody else here. Kelly's hand shot up. I volunteer as tribute. Perfect. Send Kelly. I said. Or send Taylor. You're the best I've got, Glenn said. And it's gonna be a tricky one. You just said it was the definition of easy. It's both. It's easy and tricky. And I need a top person. And that's you. Don't flatter me, I said. Glenn leaned in closer. Look, he said. He's estranged from his family. He'll barely see them. So what if you have to do a little bit of covering when they're nearby? From the looks of things, that shouldn't be too often. Glenn. His family's the whole reason he's here. But Glenn shook his head. From what we've gathered, his relationship with his older brother is completely non-existent. What about the parents? That's less clear. Either way, he doesn't spend much time with any of them. I didn't know how else to protest. Everything about this feels wrong. Glenn kept his eyes on me. You've been incognito before. To the outside world. Not to the client. The family's not the client. Jack Stapleton's the client. Same thing, I said. You won't be bored anymore, that's for sure, Glenn said. Hello? Kelly said, waving to the room. I said I'll do it. I'm volunteering. You don't even have to pay me. I'll pay you. It's unethical, I said, turning to her. But Kelly flung her arm toward the photo of Jack Stapleton still lingering on the whiteboard. Who cares? Was it unethical? Ethics were a little hard to gauge in this business. The thing about private security was, it had exploded in recent years, partly because the world was more dangerous for rich people and partly because those same people were more paranoid. Agents came from all backgrounds with different kinds of training, ex-military, ex-police, even ex-firefighters, like Doghouse. Most agents freelanced. Nothing was standardized. It was like the Wild West, really, with people doing anything they thought they could get away with. It meant more freedom, but also more risk and a lot more shenanigans. Ultimately, we were only accountable to the clients. We had to keep them happy, and for the most part, we did whatever they asked. I once had a client ask me to cover his $7,000 bar bill. I once went skydiving with a Belgian princess. I once spent a night keeping an eye on a client's panther. Was this Jack Stapleton thing that much weirder? You served at the pleasure of the client, is what I'm saying. At least, if you wanted to get paid. It's likely everybody in that conference room saw the situation clearly except for me. If Jack Stapleton wanted a pretend girlfriend, he got a pretend girlfriend. And if I wanted to work for Jack Stapleton, then that's what I had to be. The point is, Glenn went on, it's such a great opportunity for you. And it's money for you. It's money for all of us. I was still shaking my head. 
We can't do a proper job under these parameters. It'll be harder, yes. Glenn conceded. But keep in mind, his threat level is almost white. I gave him a look. It's yellow. Kelly jumped in. But a very light yellow. Almost like a lemon sorbet. Glenn pointed at Kelly. Stop naming cutesy shades of threat levels. Glenn wasn't taking me seriously. So I said, I think you've got dollar signs in your eyes. It was a test. To see how he'd react. I told you I could read faces, right? By the way his jaw tightened, I could read that Glenn was insulted. That's when I started to cave. He genuinely thought we could handle this. Do you think I'm just going to throw us all into the fire? Glenn said. Everybody's reputation's riding on this, especially mine. I'm saying it's doable. I'm saying there are strategies for making it work. I sighed. Like what, exactly? A remote backup team, for one. Cutting-edge surveillance tech. Placing you as the eyes and ears on the inside with full 24-hour backup teams on the outside. I guess I could kind of see his point. Then Glenn upped the ante. The point is, he said, if you want any chance of getting the London position, you're going to get on board. So I'm doing this whether I like it or not. Pretty much. But it would be nicer if you'd like it. I looked around the room. Everyone was watching me. Why was I making such a fuss? How about this, Glenn said next, both of us aware that he had all the power. Do this without complaining, and I'll send you wherever you want for your next assignment. You can take your pick. The career thing's back on. You want it? It's yours. I've been waiting for another career assignment ever since the last one got cancelled. I do want career, I said. Done, Glenn said. Six weeks in Seoul. Endless bowls of black bin noodles. I tried that idea on for size. Is that a yes? Glenn asked. Are we settled? No more whining and foot dragging. I was just about to say yes, and we were just about to have a deal, when I heard Robbie's voice behind me. Are you serious? Robbie said. This is never going to work. Everybody turned to stare at him. Timing had never been Robbie's thing. Robbie was looking around the group like the whole room was crazy. Is everyone kidding? This has to be a joke. Was he worried about my safety? Was he protesting the way that Glenn was strong-arming me? Was he maybe jealous? I studied the layers of outrage on his face. And that's when Robbie cleared everything up. He held his hands out toward me in a behold. Gesture and said, just look. Nobody in a million years will ever possibly believe that this person, right here, bested the legendary Kennedy Monroe to become Jack Stapleton's girlfriend. First things first. We could settle the Jack Stapleton thing later. I flew the ten steps to where Robbie was standing, grabbed him by the knot of his necktie so tight that it choked all the pompous, judgmental ass hattery off his face, and I dragged him by the neck out to the reception area hoping to yell at him alone. But of course everybody followed us. I was too mad to care. What is your problem, man? I demanded, letting go as he coughed and sputtered. The last time I saw you, you were dumping me. It's been radio silence from you for a full month, and now you show back up here and act like you're the one who was wronged. Is this how you compete for London? With insults and name calling like a grade school bully. What is happening? And here I pressed my pointer finger to his forehead in that testosterone soaked, raisin sized brain of yours that you cannot stop pelting insults at me. In front of everybody. What? Is. Wrong with you? Our entire audience, semi hidden behind the Fika's plants, 
waited for Robbie's answer. But before Robbie could say anything, the elevator dinged, and the door slid open. And out stepped Jack Stapleton. You really can't overstate the drama of the collective indrawn breath at the sight of the destroyer himself, in the flesh, stepping into our office. Of all places. I, of course, had already met the destroyer. I'd rolled his fingers around on an ink pad. I'd forced him to copy the lyrics of the Aretha Franklin song Respect for his handwriting sample. I'd stuck him with a needle. And I may or may not have dislocated his shoulder. So I wasn't quite as shocked to see him as everybody else. But even I was shocked. Same t-shirt, same jeans, but now wearing a baseball cap and sneakers, too. He looked just ordinary enough to put ordinary people to shame. I looked around at my co-workers, staring, Amadi, the valedictorian of his high school and now a kind-hearted dad of three, Kelly, the stress knitter who had made scarves for every person in the office, Doghouse, the ex-firefighter who'd gotten his nickname not because he was in everyone's doghouse, but because he compulsively fostered homeless puppies. Jack Stapleton's presence in our office made them all seem more real. And they made him seem, unreal. We waited for him to do something. So he took in the sight of my finger on Robbie's forehead and said, Are you bullying that poor co-worker? I dropped my hand. What are you doing here? He aimed his gaze right at mine, lit up those legendary grey-blue eyes, and said, Hannah Brooks. I really need you. Back by the copy machine, Kelly released a burble of vicarious delight. Jack took a couple of steps closer to me. I need to apologize for not giving you the whole picture sooner. And I need to say that I understand your hesitations. And here, he dropped to his knees on the industrial carpet, I need to ask you to be my girlfriend. Every single person in the room was frozen still. Get up, I said, trying to grab Jack by the shoulders and what? Somehow hoist all 200 plus pounds of his solid muscle back up. You don't have to do this. But he was unbudgeable. Duh. I really need your help, he went on. I have to be here for my mom, and I can't show up here and bring danger, or risk, or, you know, assassinations with me. And I can't make this moment any harder on her than it has to be. Please, please take the assignment. And please help me protect her by concealing who you really are. What are you doing, was all I could think of to say. He pulled my hands into his. I'm begging, Jack answered. I'm begging you. His expression was so earnest, so plaintive, so intense, for a second, I thought he might cry. And I was dumbfounded. Again. For the second time that day. Because nobody cries like Jack Stapleton. Do you remember how he cried in the destroyers? Most people remember the moment when he blows up the mineshaft. And of course the scene where he gives himself surgery with no anesthesia. And the catchphrase, never say goodbye. But what actually made that movie great was the sight of an action hero, at his darkest moment, thinking he'd lost everyone he loved and failed them beyond recognition, weeping tears of grief. You never see that, ever. That's what made that movie a classic. That's what made it better than all the hundreds of others just like it, that raw, human moment of vulnerability coming from the last guy you'd ever expect. It made us all want to be better people. It made us all love him and humanity just a little bit more. Anyway. This scene in the reception area was a little like that. But with Ficus plants. He didn't wind up crying in the end. But just the suggestion of it was enough. Jack Stapleton, the Jack Stapleton, was on his knees. Begging. And here's the truth. This should have been the epiphany when I realized that Jack Stapleton deserved all his fame and more. Everything he did right then held me, and everyone else, spellbound. The man could act. He leaned his kneeling body forward and looked up at me with his hands clasped. I'm begging you to help my sick mom, he said. I mean, 
Come on. I'm not made of stone. Fine, I said, summoning a rather Oscar-worthy fake nonchalance. Stop begging. I'll be your girlfriend. And then I went ahead and snuck one peek at the slack-jawed expression on my terrible ex-boyfriend's lousy, ratty, deplorable face. Which, to be honest, felt like a win for the good guys. And for humanity. And especially, at last, for me. 7. The next morning, I drove west out into State 10 with Jack Stapleton in his shiny black Range Rover to meet his parents, fully in character as his pretend girlfriend. Glenn had sent over a pretend wardrobe for the pretend girlfriend, courtesy of a personal shopper lady friend of his. No pantsuits allowed. Fair enough. That's how I wound up wearing an embroidered sundress with sandals, my hair wrapped in a messy bun. I guess it's hard to feel professional in a sundress with puffy cap sleeves. It was late October, I should mention, but that can mean anything in Texas, weather-wise, and it was a solid 80 degrees outside. Even so, I felt underprepared, a little bit chilly, weirdly naked, and uncharacteristically vulnerable. I missed my pantsuit, is what I'm saying. And yet. I could see why Jack would want to do it this way. When my mom was sick, I'd been all about bolstering her spirits, and keeping her hopes alive, and protecting her from despair. I got it. The idea that Jack might be in danger could be very stressful. It's hard enough being sick. I'd thought about it last night as I'd driven the freeway, doing a quick route assessment out to the ranch and back and I decided I was fine with it. In theory, at least. Now, today, as it was actually happening, I was less fine. I sat primly in the passenger seat with my knees pressed together, feeling not myself. Jack Stapleton, in contrast, positively lounged in the driver's seat, steering with one hand and man spreading like a champion. Hair and brush defiantly. Chewing gum. Wearing aviator sunglasses like he'd been born in them. We were going to a ranch, so I guess I'd expected a cowboy look from him. But he seemed more like we were heading for a weekend at the Cape, a snub blue polo and stone-colored khakis with loafers and no socks. True, I grew up in Houston. You might guess I'd been to a ranch before. But, honestly, no. I'd been to the Eiffel Tower, the Acropolis, the Taj Mahal, and the Forbidden City in Beijing, but I'd never been to a Texas ranch. I guess I was always too busy escaping. Until now. I touched the skin of my knees and worried about how naked they were. Should I have worn jeans? Did I need to worry about rattlesnakes? Fiance? Cacti? I had a pair of stop sign red cowboy boots that my mom had given me for my 18th birthday, saying every Texas girl should own a pair of boots. I'd never had a good reason to wear them until now. They weren't part of my official girlfriend wardrobe, but I'd packed them on principle. Right? If I wouldn't wear them on a ranch, I'd never wear them anywhere. Maybe I should put them on. For tarantula protection, if not for style. Behind his shades, I saw Jack glance over at my hands. Are you nervous? he asked. Yes. No. Good. This won't last long. My parents will be glad to see us, but my brother hates me, so he'll get rid of us pretty fast. We're probably going to need to talk about that. My brother. Yep. Nope. I'm just saying, the more I know, the better I can help you. So therapy is included. Sometimes. You signed the non-disclosure agreement, right? Of course. Jack thought about it. Yeah. I'm still not talking about it. Your call, I said. I'd been so flustered the first time we met that I'd forgotten to run through the very personal questionnaire, 
and now seemed like as good a time as any. I pulled my JS file out of my bag. Let's do some other questions, though. We still had 30 minutes on the freeway. Jack didn't agree to answer, but he didn't refuse, either. I pulled out a ballpoint pen. Are you on any drugs that we need to be aware of? Nope. Any vices? Gambling? Hookers? Shoplifting? Nope. Obsessions? Secret lovers? Not at the moment. You sound awfully monkish for a world-famous actor. I'm taking a break. Noted. I went on. Anger management problems. Deep dark secrets. No more than anybody else. Mental note, a tad evasive there. I turned back to the list. Medical concerns? Picture of health. Markings? He frowned. Markings? On your body, I clarified. Tattoos. Birthmarks. Moles remarkable or otherwise. I have a freckle shaped like Australia, he said, pulling to untuck his shirt. Stop. I said. I know what Australia looks like. I wrote down Australia freckle and then went on. Scars? A few. Nothing to write home about. At some point, I'll need to get pictures of everything. Why? I refuse to hesitate. In case we need to identify your body. My dead body. Your live body. Like in a ransom photo. Not that it would ever come to that. That's disturbing. I kept going. Other physical abnormalities. Like? Most people just answered the questions. I don't know. Crooked toes. Extra tooth. Vestigial tail. Get creative. Nothing's coming to mind. Okay. Next. Sleeping difficulties. I waited for him to demand examples, but instead, after a pause, he just said, nightmares. I nodded, like got it. Frequency. A couple of times a month. A couple of times a month. Recurrent. What? Is it the same nightmare every time? Yep. Can you tell me what it's about? Do you need to know? I mean, kind of. He worked the steering wheel like he was considering his options. Finally, he said, drowning. Okay, I said. It was only one word, but it felt like a lot. Next question. Any phobias? A pause. Then a curt nod. Also drowning. I noted that in the file and was about to move on when he added. And bridges. You have a phobia of bridges. He kept his voice tight and matter-of-fact. I do. The idea of bridges or actual bridges. Actual bridges. Ha. Huh. Okay. How does that manifest? He chewed on the inside of his lip as he weighed his options, deciding how much to share. Well, in about 20 minutes, we're going to come to part of the highway that goes over the Brazos River. And when that happens, I'm going to pull over, stop the car, get out, and walk across the bridge on foot. What about the car? You're going to drive it over the bridge and wait for me on the other side. Is that how you always cross bridges? It's how I prefer to cross them. But what if you're by yourself? I try not to be by myself. But if you are? If I am, I hold my breath and keep going. But then I have to pull off the road for a while. Why do you pull off the road? To throw up. I took that in. Then I asked, why are you afraid of bridges? Do I have to tell you? 
no. Then let's just say that America's infrastructure isn't nearly as sturdy as we'd all like to think. And leave it at that. We never did finish the questions. When we got close to the Brazzers Bridge, Jack really did pull over on the shoulder just before the bridge, get out of the Range Rover, and walk across on foot. I did my part and drove to meet him on the other side. I waited for him, leaning against the bumper of his car, rocking from the blasts of 18-wheelers zooming by, watching the tension in his face and the focus of his eyes as he made a straight line from one shore to the other. Wow. How many people have driven past a random pedestrian walking across a highway bridge, never realizing it was megastar Jack Stapleton? When he reached me, his face was pale and there was sweat on his forehead. You weren't joking, I said. I never joke about bridges. He got back in the driver's seat and rolled down the windows, and, with that, he shifted back into character as a relaxed, carefree guy who had it all. You've asked me a lot of questions today, Jack said then. I haven't asked you even one. And we should keep it that way. I can't ask you questions. You can ask. I said with a little I don't make the rules shrug. But the question he asked wasn't what I was expecting. He turned and looked me up and down. Have you done any acting? Given where we were headed at that very moment and the collaboration I'd just signed up for, this was one I probably needed to answer. A first. I thought about it. I've portrayed a few barnyard animals in a few Christmas pageants. So that's a full no. I tried to give him something. There are elements of acting to my job. Sometimes I have to play a kind of role in a situation. But it's mostly about blending into the background, or vaguely seeming like a personal assistant. Jack nodded, thinking. Never anything so, detailed, though. Okay, he said, still thinking. I'm going to tell them that you're my girlfriend, and that should do a lot of the heavy lifting. Once that's established, I'll do most of the work. I mean, who lies about having a girlfriend? All you really have to do is just be pleasant. Be pleasant, I said, like I was writing it down. Yeah, like, you don't have to memoize lines, or deliver a soliloquy. This isn't Shakespeare. Just be normal, and the context should do the rest. So I don't have to act like I'm madly in love with you. He gave a little sideways glance. Not unless you want to. What if they don't believe you? That I'm your girlfriend? I hadn't realized how vulnerable it would feel to ask this question until I was doing it. But Jack gave a confident nod. They'll believe me. Why? You're totally my type. I couldn't resist. Cleaning ladies are your type. He pointed at me. That was an honest mistake. I actually had no idea how I was going to pass for Jack Stapleton's girlfriend. I did not buy for a second that I was his type. I'd done a thorough Google search on him and I'd seen enough Barbie dolls to last me a lifetime. One of them had clearly had so much cosmetic surgery, I couldn't help but wonder if her mother missed her face. Not to mention Kennedy Monroe. Hey, I said then. What about your real girlfriend? What do you mean real girlfriend? I gave a sharp sigh. I think your parents might notice that I am not Kennedy Monroe. Jack puffed out a laugh. Then he said, my parents don't pay attention to that stuff. Are you saying your parents don't know you're dating Kennedy Monroe? You were on the cover of People. In matching sweaters. It's possible. It's really not. Nobody doesn't know that. Jack thought about it. Then he shrugged. If they ask, I'll just tell them we broke up. But they won't ask. They know nothing in Hollywood is real. Was Kennedy Monroe not real? Suddenly, I felt too shy to ask. I tried to imagine anyone believing that Jack would downshift from Kennedy Monroe to me. Just how gullible were these parents? Were they in comas? 
The sound of Robbie saying there was no way I could pass echoed through my mind, and I so hated that I agreed with him. But here we were. Jack was still noodling on it. I think our best option is just for you to smile a lot. That didn't sound too hard. Just smile. At them. At me. Just smile until your cheeks hurt. Got it. How do you feel about me touching you? How did I feel about Jack Stapleton touching me? What kind of touching are we talking about? Well, the way I am around girlfriends. I'd say that I tend to touch them a lot. You know. If you're into someone, you just want to be touching them. Sure, I said. So, that could add some authenticity. Agreed. Would it be okay for me to hold your hand? Not a hard question. Yes. Can I, drape my arm over your shoulders? Another nod. That sounds acceptable. Can I whisper things in your ear? That might depend on what you're whispering. Maybe it's better to ask, is there anything you don't want me to do? Well, I prefer you to keep your clothes on. That's a given, he said, while hanging out with my parents. But just broadly, I said. In general. No surprise nakedness. Agreed. And right back at YA. And I can't imagine that you'd need to kiss me. I've already thought about that. He'd already thought about that. We can use stage kissing, he said. If we get in a pinch. What is stage kissing? It's what you do in a play. It looks like a kiss, but your mouths don't actually touch. Like I could cup your face and then kiss my thumb. He lifted his hand off the steering wheel and kissed his thumb for demonstration. Ah. Okay. Probably shouldn't try that today. No. Those take some practice. Practicing fake kissing with Jack Stapleton. Got it. Then I added, and obviously, of course, if you need to do a real kiss for some reason, that's fine. I mean, I'm fine with it, if it's necessary. I mean, I won't be mad. Good God. I sounded like a loony bird. Noted, Jack said, moving right along as if he encountered this particular brand of looniness all the time. Which he probably did. He went on, I guess what I'm trying to say is that I appreciate what you're doing for me and my mom and I don't want to make you uncomfortable. Thank you. I'll try not to make any wrong moves, but if I mess up, just tell me. Same, I said. And with that, he cranked up the radio, rolled back the sunroof, and found himself a fresh piece of cinnamon gum. 8. Tiki Stapleton's ranch was many long, labyrinth-like roads from the highway, deep in farm country. You had to pass fields of corn and cotton and pastures full of cows. There was even a field with real live longhorns. When we arrived, Jack turned onto a half-mile, gravel entry road that started at a cattle guard, crossed a wide open field, and seemed to go on forever. How big is this ranch, anyway? I asked, starting to suspect that it was not small. Five hundred acres, he said. The sheer size made it more real for some reason. This was an actual place. Those were genuine barbed wire fences. Bona fide humans lived here. This was really happening. But it didn't really happen, in the end. We never made it to the ranch house. I saw the house up ahead in the distance, white stucco with a red Spanish tile roof, but halfway up the gravel entrance road, we spotted a guy out in the field who could only be Jack's brother. I don't want to call him a poor man's Jack Stapleton, but that's about right. Same jawline. Same posture. He had on brown ropers and a plaid shirt and a blue gimme cap. Is that your brother? I asked. Jack nodded. Yep. Meet my folks ranch manager and my own personal nemesis, Hank Stapleton. Jack stopped the car and shifted to park right there in the one-lane road. 
We watched as Hank pulled a hay bale off the back of a pickup bed and dropped it by his feet. Then he looked up and saw us. He went still and stared. He didn't wave. He didn't walk toward us. Just pulled off his work gloves and watched us, all wary, like he'd seen a coyote or something. And I'll tell you this, the minute those guys locked eyes, every muscle on Jack's body tightened. It was downright animalistic. Estranged. Yeah, that about captured it. I thought about those rumors that Kelly had never been able to confirm. The car accident. The possibility that Jack had been driving after drinking. Did Hank Stapleton seem like he might be looking at a drunk driving manslaughter who had covered it all up to save his career? Sure. Why not? He certainly wasn't looking at someone he was glad to see. Stay here, Jack said. And as he got out and walked into the field toward his brother, it definitely had a shootout at the O.K. Corral vibe. I could almost hear the spaghetti western theme music. Were they going to have a fight out there, with Jack all sockless in a pair of Italian loafers like a city slicker? I put my fingers on the door handle, ready to spring out if Jack needed me. Then I waited, watching. Was I going to eavesdrop on them? Most definitely. I rolled down the windows and cut the motor and, at first, I thought I couldn't hear them. Until I realized they weren't actually talking. Unless you could call hostile silence a type of conversation. Finally, Hank said. I see you brought an entourage. Just my girlfriend. Hank glanced my way. That doesn't look much like Kennedy Monroe. I cringed. No shit. Jack shook his head. Stop reading people. We broke up. You haven't been here in two years, and you bring some random brand new girlfriend. Trying to even up the teams. For the record, I don't want you here. For the record, I already knew that. Mom insisted. And Dad wants what Mom wants. I knew that, too. I don't need you making this any harder for her than it has to be. Agreed. A long silence. What were they doing? Then Hank said, anyway, you can head back to the city. She's not up for a visit today. Jack looked over toward the house. Then back at Hank. Is that her assessment or yours? She's in bed with the curtains drawn, so I expect we're in agreement. Where's dad? He's with her. When Jack spoke again, his voice was tight. You could have let me know before I drove all the way out here. A pause. I don't have your number. Anymore. They may have said other things after that, but I confess I missed them. Because right then, out of nowhere, like something out of a horror film, a giant face appeared at my open car window. A giant, white cow face. It was close enough that I could feel its humid, otherworldly breath washing over my skin. I don't want to say the cow snuck up on me, but let's just say the field had been empty up to that point and then suddenly boom. What were the cow's intentions? We'll never know. But in one second, there it was. And one second later, the face came through the open window and licked my forearm. With its rough, green tongue. Maybe I screamed. Or maybe not. It's a blur. I definitely made a noise of some kind, though loud enough to get that cow, and apparently the whole herd that was right behind it, to gallop away a few steps, before seeming to run out of energy, slow to a stop, and turn to stare at me. At this point, I, in the Range Rover, was surrounded by a whole herd of white, floppinecked, sad-faced cows. And I'm not going to pretend it wasn't scary. Of course, cows aren't generally regarded as terrifying creatures. But here's what you never realize when you see them on milk cartons, or on TV, or even in some distant field, they are enormous. They make even Jack Stapleton look small. So even though I was safely encased in a luxury SUV, 
I could still feel my heart going double time in my chest. I was surrounded by them. A hundred. A thousand. A whole hell of a lot. All with limpid black eyes, and surprisingly feminine lashes, staring point blank into my soul. Whatever noise I'd just made, it startled Jack, too. At the sound, he turned and started running back toward the car, and the genuine concern I saw on his face right then only amplified my anxiety. In my defense, here are the facts as I experienced them. 1. I was attacked by a cow. 2. Fine. I screamed. 3. Jack Stapleton came running. Doesn't that feel like cause for concern? At the edge of the herd, Jack slowed, adjusting into a calm saunter, but he kept his eyes on me. He entered the crowd of beasts and walked calmly among them until he'd reached the driver's door. He climbed in. What happened, he said then, looking me over, all intense. I blinked, like duh. Are you hurt? What was it? What was it? I said. Look around. Jack looked around, but didn't seem to see anything. What am I looking for? What are you looking for? I asked, and then I launched my arm in a panoramic, as if to say, behold. Terror in all directions. Now his expression was shifting. Do you mean? And then he gave the tiniest head shake, like he was rejecting the guess even as he was making it, the cows. Keeping my eyes on his, I nodded. The cows, he confirmed. We're talking about the cows. That's why you just screamed. I tried to recalibrate. In case you haven't noticed, we're fully surrounded. Yeah, he said. By cows. I could feel his tone shifting, but I wasn't sure what it was shifting to. There are millions of them, I said. There are thirty, he said, to be exact. I heard. Are they? I didn't quite know how to put it. Angry? Jack squinted a little. Do they look angry? I double-checked my read on them, just boldly standing there, staring. It feels a little aggressive. Jack turned to me then, in fascination. Are you afraid of these cows? I'm not going to comment on that. You, who flipped me on my ass without even trying? These cows make you look like a dollhouse person. But you know that cows are gentle creatures, right? I've heard of people getting trampled by cows. That happens. Well, sure. If you trip and fall right in front of one that's already running, maybe. But on the aggression scale. He tilted his head and thought about it. Nope. They're not even on the scale. Now I felt like I had to stand up for myself. I wasn't the only person scared just now. You came running like a shot. Yeah. Because you screamed. Why did you think I did that? I didn't know. Copperhead snake. Fire ant attack. Murder hornets. Something scarier than cows. But whose side was I going to take besides my own? I doubled down and declared, one of them attacked me. Define attacked. It licked me. With intention. Now he was suppressing a smile. You mean, as if it might, what? Eat you? Who knows what its end game was? Trampled by a cow might be a thing. Eaten by a cow is definitely not in any way ever a thing. The point is, I was licked. By its green tongue. I didn't even know cows had green tongues. Jack's expression got totally hijacked by amusement now. He closed his eyes, then opened them. Cows don't have green tongues. It's the cud. I stared at him. It's grass, he said. It's regurgitated grass. What? I thrashed around, trying to wipe off my already dry arm again on my sundress. Watching this made Jack actually laugh. 
He leaned forward and rested his forehead on the steering wheel, and I watched his shoulders shake. What? I said. It's legitimately disgusting. This just made his shoulders shake harder. What is so funny? Now he leaned back against the headrest, still laughing. You're afraid of cows. Um, hello? We are outnumbered. I looked around. We are totally surrounded. I mean, what happens now? Do we just have to live here? But Jack just kept laughing. I thought it would be a banana spider, at least. You think I'd be scared of a spider? You've clearly never seen a banana spider. Can you just get us out of here, please? Now I kind of want to stay. This could be a reality show. Then his face just relaxed into a big grin. My money's on the cows. I glared at him until he put the car in drive and slowly eased forward into the herd. I put my hand over my eyes, but after a second, I had to look. The herd was moving for us, stepping away, like whatever. As he turned off the gravel road and into the field, steering a bumpy and wide U-turn over ant beds and thistle bushes, Jack just kept laughing, wiping at tears with one hand and steering with the other. Oh God, he said finally, as we pulled back up onto the gravel, now driving away from the house, back toward town. Thank you so much. What are you thanking me for? I asked. But Jack just shook his head in amazement. I did not expect to laugh today. 9. Be by the time we made it back to Jack's house in the city, I was ready for some relief. Everything about that trip to the country was destabilizing, from the dress I was wearing to the cow attack. I was not going to love being undercover. But the team had taken the day to finish outfitting the city house, and so the garage was now set up as an on-site security headquarters. More surveillance cameras were up and operational, mostly outside, around the perimeter, in spots where stalkers were most likely to lurk, supplementing the ones at his back door, the patio, and inside his front hallway. We wouldn't be here all the time. He was only threat level yellow, after all. I'd put in a regular, 12 hour shift and then Jack would be on his own for the night. We'd instruct him, again, to read the handbook and make good choices on his own and would monitor the security cameras for significant movement. Different members of the team would be on call. All this was standard. Once we got back to the house, I could fall into my normal role. I changed out of the dress, which somehow felt too fluttery to allow me to do my job right, and back into a pantsuit, and then I stood just outside Jack's door in the atty's position. Me and the fiddle leaf fig. The plan was this, on normal days in the city with Jack, I would be the primary agent, staying with him wherever he went during my shift. Doghouse was the secondary agent, as backup. And then there was a remote team of Taylor and Amadi doing light remote surveillance, mostly monitoring the cameras. Kelly wasn't involved. Glenn had decided the socks with Jack's face were a deal breaker. Robbie wasn't on the team, either. I wouldn't have expected Glenn to pass up an opportunity to force us to work together. Glenn was a big fan of punishment. Especially if he could meet it out himself. But it wasn't my job to question him. No Robbie was fine with me. On the days that Jack and I had to visit his parents, the teams would flip, Taylor and Amadi would be primary agents, doing heavy surveillance remotely with Doghouse, and I would be secondary, a set of eyes and ears on the inside, but mostly just there to not blow my cover. It goes without saying that I preferred being primary. I also preferred being able to do my job right. How exactly was I supposed to compete for London, if all I could do was stand around in a cotton dress? Being back in town felt good. Standing guard at a front door is not always the most thrilling use of time, but compared to feeling useless while being menaced by cattle, it was surprisingly comforting. At one point, Jack popped his head out to see if I'd like a cappuccino. I didn't meet his eyes. 
No, thank you. You sure? Don't break my concentration. Toward the end of my shift, Taylor and Robbie showed up at the property to make a few notes on the garden layout. What are you doing here? I said to Robbie. You're not on this assignment. Everybody's on this assignment, Robbie said. This is a team effort. We're a team. That's not how it usually works. We don't usually have clients this famous. It was almost time for me to punch out, and Taylor and Robbie had been gone a while, when I decided to give the surveillance cameras one more check. We had the monitor set up at a makeshift desk, but I didn't even sit in the rolling chair. I just leaned in to scroll through the camera views, just for a quick all clear before heading home, when I noticed something on the monitor. Down in the corner of pool one camera view I saw what looked like a pants leg and part of a shoe. All my hackles went up. I enhanced the image to get a better look, and then I adjusted the camera angle to the right. And that's when I saw something I never, ever would have expected to see. In Jack Stapleton's garden, out by the pool house, partially hidden behind a palmetto tree. Robbie, my ex, and Taylor, my friend were kissing each other. Robbie, who had dumped me a month ago on the night after my mother's funeral, and Taylor, who had come over right afterward to console me while I cried, were kissing. And worse than that, on the job. There's no way to describe how it felt to live through that moment. My eyes tried to look away but could only stare, clockwork orange style, as the two of them went on and on all tangled and pressed together, sucking face like hateful teenagers. Remember when I couldn't feel any feelings about Robbie? Well, that cured that. The closest word I have for it is panic. Just an agonizing, urgent feeling that I needed to turn it off, or make it stop, or find some way for it to not be happening. Then add some rage. And some humiliation. And disbelief too, as I tried, and failed, to understand what I was seeing. It was a physical feeling, burning and searing, like my heart was pumping acid instead of blood. Up until that moment, I didn't even know that feeling existed. At some point, five minutes later. Five hours, I heard a voice over my shoulder. They should get fired for that, huh? I turned. It was Jack Stapleton, his eyes on the monitor. As I looked at him, he looked at me, and his expression shifted from amusement to concern. Hey, he said. Are you okay? But I didn't know what to do with my face. It was like the muscles didn't work right. My eyes stayed wide and bewildered, and my mouth couldn't seem to close itself. Jack certainly didn't know how universe-shattering this moment was for me, and the last thing I wanted was for him to find out. I wanted to cover. To smile and shake my head and say, idiots, like they were just dumb co-workers who I was judging for fooling around on the job. But I couldn't smile. Or shake my head. Or speak. What was Jack even doing here, anyway? Shouldn't he be inside doing movie star stuff? And then I realized something else, as Jack pulled the cuff of his shirt sleeve over the heel of his hand, lifted it to my face, and started dabbing at my cheeks. I was crying. My eyes were, at least. Without my permission. After a few dabs, Jack pulled his hand away to show me how the wetness had darkened his cuff, and, with a tender voice I remembered from the grand finale of You Wish, he said, What's going on here? At last, I shook my head. A historic achievement, all things considered. Activating the neck muscles seemed to release the jaw muscles as well, and I was able to close my gaping mouth. With that, I became functional enough to look away. Are you crying? Jack asked, trying to step around. Of course I was. Obviously I was. But I shook my head. I thought you were a tough guy. I already told you, I'm not. I believe you now, Jack said. 
it's allergies, I insisted. But I didn't even sound convincing to myself. What are you allergic to? Your co-workers kissing by my infinity pool? I should have gone with pollen. Right? A classic. But instead, as my brain short-circuited, I felt that acid bleeding out from my heart and saturating me from the inside. What was I allergic to? I was allergic to disappointment. I was allergic to betrayal. I was allergic to friendship. To hope. To optimism. To life, to work, to humanity in general. And so just I answered with, I'm allergic to everything, and I walked out of the garage. Jack let me leave, which was a relief. I didn't want to talk, or process, or explore my feelings, for God's sake and even if I had wanted to do any of those things, I would never in a million years have done them with him. You don't talk about your life with clients. You just don't. You wind up knowing everything about your principles, but they never know anything about you. And that's how it has to be. But here's the thing, the clients never understand that. It feels so much like a real relationship, it's hard to keep it clear. You're traveling together, going to bars together, skiing together, hanging out at the beach together. You're there for their ups and downs, their fights, and their secrets. Your purpose in their lives is to create security so they can feel normal. If you're doing a good job, they do feel normal. But you never do. You never lose sight of your purpose. And part of keeping that focus is knowing backward, forward, inside out, and upside down that they are not your friends. Friends might wipe the tears off your face with their shirt sleeves, but clients never should which is why I had never once in eight years cried in front of a client. Until today. You have to maintain professional distance, or you can't do your job. And the only way to do that while spending every minute of every shift together is to never, ever share anything personal. Clients ask personal questions all the time. You just don't answer. You pretend you didn't hear, or you change the subject, or most effective of all, you turn the question back on itself. The answer to are you scared, should be are you scared. The answer to do you have a boyfriend, should be do you have a boyfriend. See how easy that is. Works every time. And what's more? They never even notice. Because mostly, when people ask you about you, what they really want to talk about is them. Right? It's hard to describe the maelstrom of emotions churning around inside me as I made my way out to the driveway with the singular goal of getting to my car and heading home. Shock, agony, humiliation, all there, sure. But add to that, a sense of deep disappointment at letting myself get caught by a client in a real moment of emotion. Was there a way to recover? He'd seen the tears, yes. But he couldn't know for sure exactly what they meant. I'd go home, regroup, and then only then, if there was time and I was so inclined, would I let myself think about what I'd just witnessed. Or maybe not. Because if I just witnessed what I thought I did, it meant that in one short month, I'd lost every single one of the three most important people in my life. Mother. Boyfriend. Best friend. And now I was truly alone. The realization threatened to bring me to my knees. I had to get out of there. I had to make it to my car. But that's when Robbie, not even on the team, showed up again a few feet away. He stopped walking when he saw me, and I did the same back to him. Oh, hey, he said. Could he see my face? Could he tell that I knew? Shifts over, I said, maxing out the syllables I could access. Heading home. Great. Yeah. I think we're good here. I put my head back down to keep walking. Hey Robbie said then, taking a few steps fast, like he was going to intercept me. Can I talk to you about something? Nope, I said. Just for a minute, he said, surprised at my answer. You're not even supposed to be here, Robbie. Don't make me report you to Glenn. 
30 seconds. Was he bargaining? I'm tired, I said, shaking my head. But now Robbie jumped around to fully block me. It's kind of important. Was I going to have to fight him? For God's sake, I just wanted to go home. Not today, I said, starting to gird my strength for whatever I needed to do to not have this conversation. But that's when Robbie looked up right behind me, and then I felt a weight settling on my shoulder. It was Jack Stapleton. Draping his arm around me, as I'd already given him permission to do. She's pretty tired, Bobby, Jack said, pulling me sideways against him in a squeeze. It's Robbie, Robbie said. I'm getting a vibe like she really just wants to go home right now, Jack went on. Maybe it's from the words she's saying. Robbie, of course, couldn't go against the client. He looked at me, but I looked away. You're not going to make her report you to Glenn, are you? Jack turned to me. Or if you're too busy, I could do it. I felt more than saw Robbie's shoulders drop in defeat. Jack gave it another second, as if to say are we done here? And then, decisively, he steered me down the driveway toward my car, leaving Robbie staring after us. Later, in an effort to get Robbie in trouble, I'd report everything but the kissing to Glenn. And it would backfire. I'd say, Robbie just showed up here for no reason and inserted himself into the assignment. And Glenn would say, that's a great idea. I'd frown. What is? Putting Robbie on this assignment. No, I. I'm still deciding between the two of you for London, you know, Glenn would say. Of course I knew. Anyway, he's the best we've got for video surveillance. And you know I never want to miss a chance to torture anyone. Haven't you tortured me enough? A wink from Glenn. I meant him. Was Glenn clueless? A sadist? Little bit of both, maybe. Either way, he added Robbie to the team and gave me the credit. But that night, as Jack fished around in my purse for my keys and then hit the unlock button, I didn't see any of that coming yet. I didn't see much, really other than what was right in front of me, Jack guiding me to the passenger side, opening the door, sitting me down, and leaning across me to buckle me in. He smelled like cinnamon. Again, not something I'd normally let a client do. But so little about this assignment was normal. When Jack walked around to the driver's side, got in, and started the car, I didn't stop him. As we pulled away from his house, I mustered a week, what are you doing? I'm taking you home. But how will you get back? I'll borrow your car, he said, and come back to get you in the morning. Jack Stapleton was offering to pick me up in the morning. That seems like a lot of work. What else do I have to do these days? Your profile says you are a late sleeper. Like noon to afternoon late. I can set an alarm. Then a pause. Was that guy your boyfriend? Was that guy your boyfriend? Ah. I was too haywire to do it right. Jack frowned and tried again. You weren't dating that guy, were you? I'm not going to talk about this with you. Why not? I leaned my head back against the seat and closed my eyes. Because I don't talk about my life with clients. Even just telling a client that I didn't talk about my life with clients was more than I'd ever told a client. Another tactical error, for sure, but I was too numb to care. Just tell me that guy is not your boyfriend. That guy is not my boyfriend, I repeated mechanically. And then I don't know if it was just some meaningless sparking in my short-circuiting brain, or a new comprehension that following the rules didn't seem to get you anywhere, or a hunch that maybe nothing really mattered after all, but two seconds later, I added, in a more. 10. I made my acting debut with Jack's family the next day at the hospital. By accident. But first, we had to sneak him in. His mother had a VIP room where Jack could wait during her surgery, 
so the day should have been easy. The plan was to get him to the room unnoticed early, by six that morning, so he could see his mom before they wheeled her out. Then he'd wait there until the surgery was over, while Doghouse and I monitored the hospital halls and the rest of the team snuck out to the Stapleton's ranch to install a few secret security cameras. Things on our end were simple. All Jack had to do was stay in that room. You can't leave the room, I explained on the drive over. At all? Just stay in the room. It's not hard. Isn't that a little much? Jack asked. If you'd read the handout, I started. I'm not a handouts guy. This is a high threat situation, I went on. There are multiple opportunities for you to be seen, recognized, photographed. I get it. Once you're seen here, everything gets harder. So just do what you're told. Got it, Jack said. Then he added, you should know I'm already good at this, though. I looked over. He said, I bet the oil guys you usually protect aren't used to hiding. But I've been making myself invisible for years. That can't be easy, I said. Being you. There are tricks. Baseball caps are surprisingly effective. Glasses seem to break up people's pattern matching. Not making eye contact helps, too. If you don't look at people, they tend not to look at you. Though the big thing is to just keep moving. Just keep going. As soon as you break stride, they see you. You do no more than my average oil executive, I said, letting my voice sound impressed. See? And I didn't even read the handout. I glanced over at him. He was doing it all, the baseball cap, and the glasses, plus a grey button down. But even trying to look as unremarkable as possible, he still just, glowed. Those XX have a big advantage over you, though, I said. What's that? Nobody cares about them except me and the bad guys. Then Jack narrowed his eyes and studied me. Do you care about them? I mean, sort of, I said. That sounds like a no. I care about doing my job right. But you don't care about the people you're protecting. I shouldn't be saying any of this. Where was my head? Not in the traditional sense, no. Jack nodded and thought about it. Did he want me to care about him? What a strange expectation. Caring about people actually makes it harder to do a good job, I said then, in my own defense. I get it, Jack said. Anyway, he wasn't wrong about himself. He was good at this. He knew exactly how to move through a space without being spotted. We brought him in through a delivery entrance and up the service elevator. The hallway was deserted, and Doghouse and I saw him make it to the door and disappear through it without a hitch. That was one huge hurdle cleared. The doctors and nurses on his mom's team had signed non-disclosure agreements. Now all Jack had to do was stay there. But he didn't stay there. Just before lunch, after I'd stood at the end of the hallway long enough to know there were 207 floor tiles from edge to edge, I saw Jack walk out of the room and start meandering off down the hallway, like he was headed to the nurse's station. Hey! I shout whispered. What are you doing? But Jack didn't turn. What was he thinking? Hadn't we just talked about this? He couldn't just wander loose. I trotted after him. Hey! Hey! What are you doing? Hey! We talked about this. You're not supposed to leave the... Right then, I caught up, and I grabbed his forearm, and he turned to look at me. And it wasn't Jack. It was his brother. Hank. Oh. I said, the second I saw his face, dropping his arm and stepping back. Shit. Now that I saw him, Hank was clearly not Jack. Hank was an inch or so shorter. And a little bit broader. And his hair was a shade or two darker. His sideburns were shorter. And none of those details should have escaped me. 
If I'm honest, the smell of the hospital, and the lighting, too, reminded me of when my own mother was sick, which wasn't all that long ago and it had me slightly off my game. Hank Stapleton was staring at me. Did you just tell me I can't leave the room? I'm sorry, I said. I thought you were Jack. Hank tilted his head. Can Jack not leave the room? What to say? He wasn't planning on it, I said. No. Hank tilted his head. And who are you? I'm Hannah, I said, hoping we could leave it at that. Apparently not. He shook his head and frowned, like is that supposed to mean something? And then I did what I had to do. I said, I'm Jack's girlfriend. But I swear it felt like the biggest, fakest, most unconvincing lie in the world. But here's the surprise miracle, he bought it. Oh, sure, Hank said, looking me over, remembering. The one who's afraid of cows. How did he know that? Did my scream give it away? He went on. Did you come to see my mom? My head started nodding as my stomach turned cold. I wasn't ready. I hadn't prepared to meet the family. I wasn't even wearing my girlfriend clothes. But there wasn't another answer. Yes. She just woke up, Hank said. I'm going for ice chips. I'll get them, I offered, wanting to get him back into the room. He wasn't Jack, but he was close enough to make trouble. Plus, I needed a minute to regroup. You go on back, I said. I brought flowers, but I forgot them in the car. So ice chips. Next best thing. Flimsy. But he shrugged and said, okay. On the way to the nurse's station, I explained it all to Doghouse's earpiece. I'm going in, I said. Then, ice chips in hand, I started toward Connie Stapleton's room, but I paused when I caught my reflection in the chrome elevator doors. Did I look like a girlfriend? Anybody's, even? It was hopeless, but I tried zoozing myself a little bit, anyway. I took off my jacket and hid it behind a potted plant. I rolled my sleeves and unbuttoned the top button of my blouse. I unwrapped my hair from its bun and shook it out to fluff it. I popped my collar for a second before deciding I was too nervous to pull that off. I'd just have to make it work. I mentally reviewed what I knew about Jack's parents from the file. Dad, William Gentry Stapleton, a veterinarian, now retired. Went by document widely beloved by all who knew him. Once rescued a newborn calf from a flooded Oxbow Lake. Married to Connie Jane Stapleton, retired school principal, for over 30 years. High school sweethearts. They'd spent five years in the Peace Corps, rescued homeless horses, belonged to a recreational swing dancing club, and were, by all accounts, good people. I knocked on the door and then I opened it as I said, redundantly, knock, knock. The three Stapleton men were seated around Connie Stapleton's bed in chairs they'd pulled close. She was sitting up a little, wearing a dab of lipstick with her feathery white hair neatly brushed and looking somehow more put together than a post-surgery patient in a hospital gown had any right to. She could have pulled off a popped collar. If she'd had a collar to pop. At the sight of them, live, actual people, I started overthinking it. What kind of expression would Jack's girlfriend have on her face? Warm-hearted? Concerned? What did those expressions even look like? How did you arrange your features? How did actors even do this? I settled on a half-smile, half-frown and hoped it was convincing. Jack must have read my panic because he popped up and strode right toward me. Hey, babe, he said in a pitch-perfectly affectionate voice. I didn't know you were coming. I brought some ice, I said. Jack was looking at me, like I thought you were staying in the hallway. I just blinked at him, like change in plan. He could tell I was nervous. That must have been why he kissed me. A stage kiss, but still.
He walked right up to me without breaking stride, cupped both hands on either side of my jaw, leaned in, and planted a not insignificant kiss on his own thumb. And then he, lingered there. His hands were warm. He smelled like cinnamon. I could feel his breath feathering the peach fuzz on my cheek. I was so shocked, I didn't breathe. I was so shocked, I didn't even close my eyes. I can still see the whole thing in slow-mo. That epic face coming closer and closer, and that legendary mouth aiming right for mine and then docking itself on that legendary thumb, stationed right at the corner. Technically, it was not a real kiss. But it was pretty damn close. For me, anyway. As he pulled back, my knees wavered a little. Did he know I was going to swoon? It was like he sensed it coming. Maybe that's what happened to every woman he kissed real or fake. He latched his arm around my waist, and by the time he said, I'd like you all to meet my girlfriend, Hannah, he was basically holding me up. They took in the sight of us. Hello, I said weakly, sagging against him, but lifting my free hand in a little wave. Did I expect them not to believe it? I mean, maybe. It was so patently obvious that we were two totally different categories of people. If they'd thrown their newspapers and reading glasses at me and shouted, get out of here. I wouldn't have been surprised. But that's when Jack said, isn't she cute, and gave me a noogie on the head. Next, Hank swooped over to take the ice chips. She brought your ice chips, Mom. On the heels of that, Doc Stapleton, looking gentlemanly, pressed, and neat in a blue Oxford and khakis, took my hand, patted it, and said, Hello, sweetheart. Come take my chair. I shook my head. I can stand. She's adorable, Connie Stapleton said, and her voice just pulled me toward her with its warmth. Then she reached for my hand, and when I took hers, it was soft like powder. She squeezed, and I squeezed back. Finally. Someone real, she said then. And suddenly, I knew what to do with my face. I smiled. Yes, Connie said, looking over at Jack. I like this one already. Just the way she said it, with such full, unearned affection, made me feel a little bashful. Connie met my eyes. Is Jack sweet to you? What could I say? Very sweet, I answered. He's good-hearted, she said. Just don't let him cook. I nodded. Got it. Next, she asked the boys to help her sit up better. She was a little nauseated and a little dizzy, so they took it slow. But she was determined. When she was ready, she looked at all the faces around her bed. Listen, she said, like she was about to start an important topic. But that's when her oncologist walked in. We all stood to greet him and he definitely did a double take when he saw Jack, like he'd been told to expect a famous actor in that room, but he hadn't really believed it. Hey, destroyer, the doctor said with a little sideways grin. Thanks for saving humanity. Thanks for saving my mom, Jack said, graciously nudging us back toward reality. The doctor nodded and checked his clipboard. The margins around the edges of the tumor were negative, she said. Which means it was very self-contained. That's great, mom, Jack said. That means no chemo the doctor went on. We'll still have to do radiation, but that's not for eight weeks, after the surgery's all healed. Right now, it's about just resting, and staying hydrated, and following the discharge instructions. He turned to Connie. We'll get you on the radiation schedule, and then everybody can take a breath until it's time to start that up. What everybody wanted him to say was that she was fine, that she'd be fine. Finally, Jack did it. Is the prognosis. The doctor nodded. The prognosis is pretty good, though no guarantees. If the site heals well, after her course of radiation she's got a good chance of being okay. Jack and Hank, 
standing right next to each other, let out matching sighs. You'd never know they were mortal enemies. The doctor gave some more details, pulled a privacy curtain while he examined the site, then re-emerged, saying, I almost forgot the most important thing. We all stood at attention. What's that? The doctor pointed right at Jack. Can I get a selfie? Once he was gone, Connie Stapleton got down to business. I'm not going to ask you to stay for the radiation, Jack, she said. Mom. I can stay. It doesn't start for eight weeks. You need to get back to your life. Mom, I don't. She shook her head, cutting him off. But I am going to ask you for something else. Now Jack narrowed his eyes like he should have seen that coming. What's that? She paused. We waited. It's been a hard few years for us. For all of us. And I'd like some good time with you before you go. Jack nodded. I'd like that, too. So here it is, she went on. I don't know how much more time I have left on this earth. Getting cancer really clears a few things up in your head, and after much soul-searching, I've decided there is one thing, only one thing, that I truly want right now, and I need you all to make it happen. This sounds like a big ask, Hank said. What is it, sweetheart? Dr. Stapleton asked, leaning in. That's when Connie gave us the most irresistible, there's literally no way you can possibly refuse me smile and said, I want Jack and his cute new girlfriend to come stay with us out at the ranch until Thanksgiving. 11. Four weeks. Was all I could say on the drive back to Jack's house. There are four weeks until Thanksgiving. Technically, Jack pointed out, it's three and a half. I ignored him. I can't spend four weeks doing things I like to do, much less pretending to be your girlfriend. Thanks for that. You know what I mean. It's her dying wish, Jack pointed out. She's not dying, I said. She's probably not dying. We're all probably not dying. You could get hit by a bus tomorrow. I'm not thrilled about this, either. But it kind of simplifies things. It gives us a clear end point. For weeks, and we're done. I go back to North Dakota, you go, wherever it is you go. Korea, thank you. Even just at the idea of it, I felt a flash of relief. The timing was good, actually. The soul assignment started up in early December. This could have lingered on and on. This is objectively better. It's like ripping off the bandage. Ripping off the bandage, I corrected, for four weeks. Three and a half. Let's talk to your boss. I already know what Glenn's going to say. He's going to say I can't deny her this request. That it's not that big of a deal. That the remote teams can handle everything especially if we're in an isolated location like the ranch. He's going to call it practically a paid vacation and demand to know why, exactly, it's unacceptable to have to lounge around at the country residence of a world-famous movie star. He'll say there are worse fates than being trapped in a remote location with a beautiful man. If Jack noticed me calling him beautiful, he played it cool. And what will you say? I closed my eyes. I don't know. He's not wrong, you know. The ranch is great. There's an orchard, and a hammock, and a wilderness area near the Oxbow Lake. We can hunt fossils on the banks of the Brazos, and ride the retired circus horse, and go fishing. It would be like a paid vacation. I don't like vacations, I said. It really wouldn't be like work, is what I mean. I like work. I prefer work. You could relax. I never relax. I just mean there are worse things than being trapped there with me. I'm sure you're delightful, it's just. That sounded sarcastic. 
Look. I know it's a strange ask. It's not strange, it's impossible. You saw her back there. That's my mom, Hannah. It was so strange to hear my name come out of Jack Stapleton's mouth, it threw me off for a second. I tried to regroup. He clearly thought if he asked sweetly enough, I'd just do this for him. Or maybe if he paid me enough money. This was a guy who probably got everything he wanted. If he didn't understand why this couldn't happen, I didn't know how to explain it. I finally settled on, I don't know you. I'm not so bad. I just can't. Are you saying no? Did anyone ever say no to Jack Stapleton? Yes. I'm saying no. Jack frowned at that, like it was a really novel concept. He looked so bewildered, in fact, that as I studied his profile, I questioned myself. I was saying no, wasn't I? I mean, four weeks. That was a long time to never come up for air. There would be no way to do any of my usual work stuff in that scenario. I'd just have to wear girlfriend clothes and do girlfriend things and be, trapped behind that facade. I couldn't be that passive. I'd been stuck in limbo for so long. I needed to work, and I needed to do my job, and then I needed to be done and get out of here. With each coping mechanism this situation took away, I was dying a little more. I could feel my sharp gills gasping. I needed to make my world bigger, not smaller. I needed to go far away, not get further trapped in this same spot. I needed to resuscitate my real life, not double down on a fake one. Time to shut this conversation down. We can talk to Glenn, I said, but it's still a no. It's a yes, Glenn said, even after I vociferously, passionately, and very articulately objected to Connie Stapleton's wishes. We met in the security HQ in Jack's garage. The whole team showed up, including Robbie now, except for Taylor. Who I hadn't seen since I'd watched her smooching my ex-boyfriend. And who I would happily never see again, if I could swing it. But that was something to obsess over later. Right now I was busy fighting a losing battle. It wasn't that my opinion didn't matter. It just didn't matter more than anybody else's. Think of it like a paid vacation, Glenn said. You say that like it's a good thing. I don't see that there's a decision to be made here, Amadi said. She took the job. The situation has evolved. But that doesn't change our responsibility toward the principal. I didn't take the job on purpose, I said. That's a lot of negativity right there, Doghouse said. I signed up to protect him, not live with him, I said. Kelly was positively offended by my hesitation. Do you know how many people would sell their souls to live in that gorgeous ranch house for a month with Jack Stapleton? It was featured in House Beautiful. What am I supposed to do for four weeks if I have to stay in character 24-7? Um. Kelly said. Enjoy it. I argued and argued, but I couldn't convince them how suffocating this would be for me. Everybody, without exception, thought it sounded fun. The consensus really did solidify pretty fast, I was being ridiculous. I needed to appreciate my good fortune. And suck it up. And stop whining. In the face of all that unanimousness, there really wasn't much I could say. Glenn was loving it, too. This is your chance to show me your stuff for London, he said. But it wasn't funny. This was my life. What stuff? I demanded. Nothing about this will show anybody any stuff. It's just forced seclusion with. The sexiest man alive, Kelly finished. Glenn thought it was all endlessly funny. Strategy, flexibility, innovation, he said then, to answer my question. Plus, maybe most crucial, that all-important leadership quality of being willing to take one for the team. 
Fine, I said. But I let myself pout a little. Be nice to poor Jack, Glenn finally said. He can't help it that he's handsome. After finally losing the argument spectacularly in a vote of everybody else to one, I decided to step out for some air. I needed a minute. And that's when, out in the circular drive, I ran into Taylor arriving late. She slowed to a stop when she saw me. Now that I knew the situation, her body language was unmistakable, the downcast eyes of guilt. The tight shoulders of shame. The shallow breaths of betrayal. How had I missed it before? I'd been blinded by warmth and trust and affection. By the idea of what a friend should be. It's so easy to see what you expect to see. I narrowed my eyes into a glare, but it was too dark for her to notice. What are you doing here? I asked. Ah. Uh, coming to work? You're late. Yeah. Traffic. Is that a lie? A lie? No. There was traffic. I could hear it in her voice now. She knew something was up. Everybody's inside, I said, tipping my head toward the garage. In the surveillance room. The room where we monitor all the surveillance footage. She frowned. She could tell I was trying to say something more than I'd said. Except you, she said, like that might be a clue. Dead end. I'm taking a break. I gave her another shot. But I have spent a lot of time in that surveillance room. Surveilling things. Well, yeah. You're the primary, so. It's amazing what those cameras can catch. Things you would never, in a million years, if you lived your whole life over and over again, expect to see. And then she knew. I saw it the second the comprehension hit her. The little zap of shock in her eyes. Do you mean? She said. You. I confirmed with a nod. And Robbie. Oh. Yeah. That, that. That's what happened in Madrid. She hesitated. Which was fascinating. Because there was no weaseling out of anything now. Finally, she said, yeah. Then, as if she could redeem herself, but by accident. I knew it already, of course. And I thought seeing it would be the worst of it. But I was wrong. The confirmation was the worst of it. So, all those times I called you and cried over my broken heart, you were dating the person who broke it. Taylor looked down. At first, we weren't really dating. Just sleeping together. But not on purpose. Not entirely. There wasn't a point in even talking about it. I just wanted her to know that I knew. Then we could all be in agreement that she was a terrible person. But then she said, technically, you were broken up. I frowned. What? We didn't cheat on you, is what I'm saying. Technically. I refused to dignify that with a response. I'm sorry. I really am sorry. It just happened. We didn't know how to tell you. It just happened. You know how it is on assignment. Yes, I definitely do. Specifically with Robbie. We weren't trying to hurt you. Again with the we. We, we, we. Do you not understand the, the? I couldn't think of words that captured it. Finally, I went with the emotional atrocity you just committed. We're not talking about war crimes. You looted our friendship. You firebombed the trust one had in you. You nuked my faith in humanity. You're the Enola Gay of best friends. Maybe I was overstating it a bit. But I didn't back down, even after it occurred to me that this conversation was not that different from how we talked when we were laughing. The one big difference, now, of course, being the white-hot hatred. 
I had a real question, though. Do you not understand what you did, I asked, or are you pretending not to? I stared her down, waiting. I'll hate you forever, either way, I went on. But in one case, I'll hate you for being stupid, and in the other, I'll hate you for being selfish. Taylor looked down. Never mind. I know the answer. It's selfish. Nobody's that stupid. Not even you. I thought it might feel good to say something mean. But it didn't. Look. I hope he's worth it, I said. You just forfeited our entire friendship. You just gave up every movie night, every margarita Friday, every goofy GIF exchange, every sleepover, every Galentine's Day, every fantasy road trip, every hug, and every atom of admiration, warmth, and affection you could ever have had with me. Right? You gave up borrowing my jeans with the rainbow pockets. You gave up book recommendations, and homemade birthday cards, and late night tacos. And you gave up the best next door neighbor ever, too, because I'm definitely moving out. I could feel my voice shaking. I was trying to make her feel bad, listing everything she'd just lost. But of course, I had lost it all, too. And you knew, I went on. You knew he was terrible. You knew what he did to me, how he abandoned me right after I lost my mom. I took a long, trembling breath. That's what kills me. You gave it all up every nourishing thing we had, not just for a man, but for a bad man. I'm sorry, Taylor said. I don't care. I don't want to lose you, Taylor said, her voice trembling now, too. He's going to leave you, I said. He's left every woman he's ever been with. Did you know that? He's always the dumper, never the dumpy. And then you'll come to me and beg me to forgive you, but I won't. You want to know why? Because I can't. Because certain broken things can never be repaired. I was ready for that to be my exit line. I was ready to abandon her there in the driveway with only the echo of those words remaining. I started to walk away. But she called after me, you're wrong. I turned back. He's not going to leave me. He dumped all those other women because he hadn't found the right one. Wow. The hubris. You think you're the one? I know for sure that you weren't. OOF. And here, right here, is the trouble with being close to other people. The better they know you, the better they can hurt you. He never loved you, she said then, because you wouldn't let him. How dare she side with him? You have no idea what you're talking about. Ask him sometime. He tried. It didn't surprise me that Robbie tried to make himself out to be the victim. But it did surprise me that Taylor would believe him. She must have really needed to see me as the problem. Then she shrugged and fixed her eyes on mine. You're so sure it's all Robbie's fault. Yeah. And you should be, too. But you won't see your part in it. How was this happening? She was supposed to stand up for me. She was supposed to feel outraged and wronged on my behalf. That's what best friends were for. How can you do this? I asked, my voice sinking. You were my best friend. But Taylor shook her head. I was never your best friend. I was your work friend. And the fact that you don't know the difference. That's your whole problem right there. 12. Anywho. That's how I wound up moving to Jack Stapleton's parents' 500-acre cattle ranch against all my better judgment. Not that I had a choice. But compared to living next door to Taylor, it suddenly didn't seem so bad. Compared to staying in our fourplex with its papier-mâché walls, eating cereal in my kitchen, and listening to Robbie and the worst person ever making waffles on the other side, compared to overhearing the two of them watching horror movies on her sofa, or ordering takeout, or going at it all night in her bedroom, compared to all that, moving in with the destroyer was definitely an upgrade. 
I called my landlord from the car after that fight with Taylor to cancel my lease. I'd find a new place online and rent it sight unseen. I'd hire movers to pack up my entire apartment, dirty laundry and all, and haul it away. I'd leave on assignment, and then I'd never set foot in that apartment again. And I'd make sure my next rental had a working fireplace so I could unpack, find all the things Taylor had given me over the years, the Wonder Woman t-shirt, the journal with the You Are Magic glitter cover, the picture book of the world's cutest hedgehogs, and throw them in the fire one by one to burn them all to ashes. A purge. A cleansing. A new frigging start. The morning Jack and I moved out to the Stapleton's ranch, it was Jack who was in a bad mood. Like he was the one who'd earned one. Gone was that aggressively nonchalant vibe he wore most of the time like a cologne. His shoulders were tense as he drove, his jaw was tight, and his blood pressure, I swear, I could read it from across the car, was elevated. He barely even spoke to me the entire drive. It was the loudest quiet I'd ever heard. It was only then, on the interstate, in Jack's passenger seat, that I realized Taylor had done me a favor, in a way, she had turned going to Jack's ranch into a kind of escape. It wasn't the escape I'd been wanting. But it would do for now. That realization brightened my mood quite a bit. By the time we got to the Brazzers Bridge, and Jack got out to walk across, he looked almost nauseated. And by the time we pulled up to the house itself, the air around him was positively brittle with misery. An escape for me. But maybe the opposite for him. Though Kelly hadn't been kidding about House Beautiful. It was a 1920s Spanish-style hacienda with a red-tiled roof and pink bougainvillea blossoming everywhere. We parked on the gravel drive, and as I stepped out of the car a breeze brushed past us and fluttered the sundress around my bare knees. It felt nice, actually. I guess girlfriend clothes had their perks. It's so idyllic, I said, of the house. Jack didn't comment. But that whole think of it like a paid vacation thing? I could suddenly see it. This wasn't where Jack had grown up. He later told me that his grandparents lived here when he was little, but after they were gone, it became a weekend place. His parents had only moved out full-time after they'd retired, and that's when his mom started the garden, and his dad had converted half of the old barn into a woodworking shop. I'm pretty sure Jack didn't speak even one unnecessary word as he walked me around and gave me the tour. I was totally charmed by the stucco walls, exposed ceiling beams, rounded doorways, red ceramic tile floor, and his mom's collection of chicken figurines on the breakfront. Plus, the decorative painted tiles in the bathrooms and in the kitchen. Windows everywhere, and sunlight, and bougainvillea blossoms in every view. There was a garden that seemed to go on forever near a side porch draped with honeysuckle, and a screened porch bigger than a living room off the other side. It was like an enchanted place from another time. It was a late October day, and all the windows were open. The kitchen had cotton gingham cafe curtains, and a bread box, and an old-timey radio on the counter. There were salt and pepper shakers in the shapes of ears of corn at the table. Jack's dad kept a record player on the counter at the far end of the kitchen, and Jack opened up the cabinets above it to show me, instead of dishes, like you might expect, his massive record collection, arranged by decade. I mean, the whole situation was charming. Except, maybe, for Jack. I followed him through a long living room, with three sofas arranged around a giant stucco fireplace, and then into a hallway that led to the bedrooms. The hallway was covered absolutely wallpapered, with framed family photos. And half of them, at least, were of three boys, smiling big and goofy into camera after camera. Jack and I both stopped at the sight. Like neither of us had ever seen it before. I touched a photo of a young Jack up on a young Hank's shoulders, while Hank held their youngest brother upside down by his ankles. This is you and your brothers? I asked. Jack nodded, his eyes traveling around the wall. Looks like you had a lot of fun. Jack nodded again. Then he said, so quiet I could barely hear, 
I haven't been here since the funeral. Jack kept his eyes on the photos, so I did, too. Most of them were snapshots. The boys as toddlers running in a field of bluebonnets. Down at the beach in the waves. Eating puffs of cotton candy bigger than their heads. Then, older, tall and skinny in football uniforms. Doing matching handstands. Dangling fish at the ends of poles. On horseback. At the top of a ski slope. Playing cards. Shooting baskets. Dressed up for prom. Hamming it up. Totally ordinary. And so heartbreaking. Just as I found myself thinking I could admire those photos all afternoon, Jack pulled in a sharp breath, opened the door to his bedroom, and charged away, like he couldn't take it one more second. I followed him inside. Jack's room was the same as the rest of the house, same ceramic tile floor and stucco walls, same French doors overlooking bright pink flowers, same arched doorways. But his room felt more manly, somehow. Leatherier. It smelled like iron, and had an old saddle in the corner, and an Eames chair by the window. This is your room? I asked, to be sure. Our room, Jack said. Of course. We'd be sharing a room. We were adults, after all. Adults in a fake relationship. You can have the dresser, Jack said, dropping his suitcase on the floor beside the saddle. We can share, I said. But Jack shrugged. Doesn't matter. Next, I looked at the bed. Is that a double bed? Jack frowned, and it was clear he'd never thought about it. Maybe. Do you fit in that bed? The tiniest flicker of a smile. I have to hang my feet off the end. It had occurred to me that there was a good chance this room would have only one bed. But here we were. I'll take the floor, I said. Jack tilted his head like it hadn't occurred to him that anyone might take the floor. You can sleep in the bed, he said, and, at first, I thought he was letting me have it, before he added, I'll share. I gave him a look. It's fine. You realize that's a ceramic tile floor? I'll make it work. It was certainly better than my closet. I get it if you're uncomfortable, but I promise I won't touch you. I didn't want to admit I was uncomfortable. That was need-to-know information. I gestured at him, like look at yourself. We wouldn't both even fit in that bed, dude. Now an actual, wry smile, and I felt glad to have led us to a less painful topic. I've squeezed girls into it before, Jack said. I prefer the floor, I said, to settle it. There's no way I'm making you sleep on the floor. There's no way I'm sleeping in your bed. Let's not be fussy. I think I'm being remarkably unfussy, actually. He thought about that. Yes. You are. Thank you. I hadn't expected to be thanked. But, he went on, you still get the bed. I really don't want it, I said. Neither do I. Fine. We'll both sleep on the floor. Jack studied me like I was odd. Are you saying that even if I sleep on the floor, you'll also sleep on the floor? This might be my only area of autonomy for a month. Yes, I said. I'll be on the floor no matter what. You'd rather sleep on cold, hard, ceramic tile than sleep next to me. I bet you don't get that a lot. Jack smiled like he was impressed. Absolutely never. It's probably good for you, I said. Jack shrugged, like maybe so. Then, and it's possible a gentleman would have fought me a little harder, Jack said, suit yourself. That settled, I looked around. I honestly had no idea what this assignment was going to mean for me. Almost all my normal responsibilities had been shifted over to the remote team, which had secured an off-site rental house just across the farm road as an operations base. They were handling video surveillance, monitoring the perimeter of the property, watching social media, and doing all the things I'd normally do. 
Plus we were at threat level yellow. And we were in the middle of nowhere. In a house surrounded by 500 acres of pastures. So there wasn't even that much to do. Besides possibly track the positioning of the cattle. I mean, it might as well be threat level white. A paid vacation, everyone said. But there was a reason I never took vacations. What, exactly, was I supposed to do with myself all day? I'd be technically working. I just wouldn't have, any duties. But before I could panic, there was a rap on the door as loud as a shotgun. We both jumped. Through the door, we heard Hank. Jack, I need to talk to you. It wasn't until all of Jack's tension snapped back into place that I realized how much joking around about our sleeping arrangements had relaxed him. Even his posture shifted. He straightened up and left the room. Should I follow him? I hadn't been invited. In a normal job, whenever I was on shift, I always kept the principal in my sights. But this was anything but a normal job. Still uncertain. I made my way back to the kitchen, but I stopped when I neared the back door. Jack and Hank were just past it, on the screen porch. I couldn't see them, but I could hear their voices through the open kitchen window. And they were talking about me. You actually did it, Hank said. You actually showed up here with that girl in tow. You seemed fine with it at the hospital. Yeah. I seemed fine with a lot of things at the hospital. What am I supposed to do? Mom invited her. Only because she thought you wouldn't come without her. Mom was right. I wouldn't come without her. You're making things harder on Mom. And you don't even care. You're making things harder on her. And I care about that very much. Doesn't she have enough to deal with right now? I'm only here because she asked me to be. She wants to see you. Not some stranger. Hannah's not a stranger. She's my girlfriend. I winced a little at the lie. She's a stranger to us. Not for long. Tell her to leave. I can't. I won't. Tell her to leave, or I'll kick you both out. I dare you. I dare you to do that and then tell mom what you did. This is a private, family matter. The last thing mom needs right now is to be entertaining some Hollywood bimbo. Then I heard a scuffle. Then a clunk. I stepped closer to peek through the screen, and I saw that Jack had shoved Hank up against a wall. Does anything about that girl seem like Hollywood to you? Jack demanded. It's a heck of a thing to see two grown men fighting over you. Even if you know it's not a real fight. And even if you know the fight is really about something else. Still. I held my breath. For a second, I thought Jack was going to defend me. She's as UN Hollywood as it gets, Jack said then, his voice low and menacing. Have you seen my other girlfriends? Have you seen Kennedy Monroe? She's nothing like any of them. She's short. Her teeth are crooked. She barely wears any makeup. She doesn't self-tan, wear extensions, or dye her hair. She's a totally plain, unremarkable person. She's the epitome of ordinary. Wow. Okay. But she's mine, Jack said then. And she's staying. I was still coping with epitome of ordinary. Another scuffle, as Hank pushed Jack off of him. I stepped way back so they wouldn't see me. Of course, that meant I couldn't see them anymore, either. Fine, Hank said. I guess I'll just have to make her so miserable that she leaves on her own. If you make my Hannah miserable. My Hannah. I will make you miserable right back. You already do. That's more about you than about me, buddy, Jack said. But Hank was still trying to win the fight. I'm telling you I don't want her here. But I can't even remember the last time you cared about what anybody else wanted. 
You don't want her here, but I need her here. And so do you, even though you don't know it. So back the hell off. I guess, at that, one of them decided to storm off, because next I heard the screen door whop closed. Then, on the heels of that, I heard it again. Out the kitchen window, I could see Hank stomping off toward his truck and Jack charging in the opposite direction, along the gravel road toward a thicket of trees. What I wanted to do, was go hide my plain, unremarkable, epitome of ordinary face. For, like, ever. But Jack was my principal. And this was my job. So I followed him. 13. When I caught up, he stopped walking, but he didn't turn. Don't follow me. I have to follow you. I'm taking a walk. I can tell. I need a moment. To myself. That's not really relevant. Do you really think you're my girlfriend or something? Don't follow me. Do you really think I'm your girlfriend? I'm not following you because I want to. You are my job. At that, Jack started down the gravel road again heading very purposely toward nowhere, as far as I could tell. I let him get about a hundred feet ahead, and then I took a deep breath and followed. When Jack said he was taking a walk, he wasn't kidding. We followed the tire ruts in the road through a cow pasture, over a cattle guard, past a rusty metal barn, and down a long, slow hill into a wooded lowland overgrown with vines. Was I dressed for an excursion like that in my embroidered sundress with bare ankles? I was not. Every hundred feet or so, I had to shake the rocks out of my sandals. Really wishing I'd changed into those boots now. Did Jack know I was following him? He did. Whenever we came to a gate, he'd unlatch the chain and wait for me. Then, wordlessly, once I was through, he'd relatch it, and take off walking, and I'd wait politely until he'd re-established our distance. I even walked in the opposite rut from the one he was using, out of courtesy. The road descended deeper into the woods, and the grass got taller, and the path got more overgrown, and just as I was trying to remember what poison ivy looked like, we came to a tumble-down, rusty, barbed wire gate. Past it, the forest opened up clear to a wide, blue sky, and I realized we'd made it to the river bank. As I got closer, Jack was looking me up and down. Are you kidding me with that outfit? I looked down at my bare legs. I have boots back at the house. You should be wearing them. Noted. Jack shook his head. Never come down to the river with naked ankles. To be fair, I said, I didn't know that rule. I also didn't know we were coming to the river. Jack turned and looked at the distance ahead. The road stopped at the gate. From here to the riverbank was just tall grass and weeds and brambles and thistle bushes. And let's not forget poison ivy. Jack squatted down and turned his back toward me. Climb on. I'll give you a ride. I'm fine, thanks. Staying crouched down, Jack started counting off all the things in that grass that could come after me, sticker burrs, armadillos, stinging nettles, red ants, black ants, fire ants, poison ivy, blackberry brambles, black widows, brown recluses, copperheads, rattlesnakes, water moccasins. He waited for me to revise my answer. I hesitated. So he added, not to mention feral hogs, bobcats, and coyotes. Honestly, he'd had me at armadillos. Fine, I said, and climbed on. Jack hooked his arms under my legs and stood up fast enough to make me dizzy so I clutched him tight. Then he launched back into that patented Jack Stapleton walking pace I now suddenly knew so well. Riding was nicer. Maybe he'd carry me back. At the riverbank, the forest dropped away, and so did the earth. Jack stood at the crest of the bank for a minute as we both took in the sight of the river down below and its endless sandy beach. That's the Brazos River? I asked. Yep. It's wider than I thought. And, browner. 
But Jack didn't respond. Just launched us down the bank until we made it to the shore. There, he dropped me pretty fast, and walked off toward the water. He was heading vaguely north, so I decided to head vaguely south and give us both some space. It was probably 200 feet to the water itself, and I let my head tilt down as I walked and marveled at all the different kinds of rocks peppering the sand, brown ones, black ones, stripy ones, bits of animal bones, petrified wood, even fossils. Not to mention driftwood, an occasional tangle of rusty barbed wire, and a notable number of old beer cans. I could see why Jack wanted to come here. Across from us was a high bank with nothing but grass and sky, and all around us was the endless breeze that flowing water makes, making it feel like we were miles and miles from anywhere. Which, of course, we were. At the river's edge, I kicked off my sandals. It was a warm day, and all that jogging to keep up had left me a little hot. The water was clearer up close and, as I dipped my feet, it felt great. Cool and swirly with refreshing eddies. It felt so good around my ankles that soon I was sloshing out a little further. I lifted the hem of my sundress. I really wasn't planning to go past my knees. I was just going to cool off for a minute and enjoy it, honestly. Another few steps, and I was going to turn around. But then, a few things happened all at once. As I took my next step, I heard a sound like maybe Jack was calling my name, but it was so muffled by the wind, I couldn't be sure. I turned to look, but as I did, the floor of the river disappeared. There was just, nothing for my foot to land on. And so I lost my balance and splashed down into the water. It's always shocking to land in cold water when you're not expecting it, but there was something more shocking about the water in that river. It had a current. A really strong current. A current strong enough that when I hit the water, I didn't bob back up to the surface with a kick or two, because the water tubbed me downward. It all happened so fast. I was sloshing through the water and then, within seconds, my head was going under. It actually gives me shivers to think about it now. How close I came to drowning. But just as it happened, before I had time to panic, I felt something hard as metal clamp around my arm and haul me back up. Jack. He yanked me out and toward him like some kind of machine, grabbing me around the waist and clamping me with an OOF to his chest, then dragged me back to the bank so fast, we both stumbled and fell onto the sandy shore. Did he land on top of me like we were in from here to eternity? Yes, that happened. Was it in any way romantic like that? Um. No. As soon as he could, Jack scrambled up and stomped away, leaving me drenched, and stunned, and coughing on the sand. When I caught my breath, I said, what was that? A riptide? Are you kidding me, he demanded, his jeans soaking wet from the thighs down. Did you just wade out into the brazzers? Did that just happen? I stood up and tried unsuccessfully to brush the wet sand off my legs. Was I, not supposed to do that? Nobody's supposed to do that. Don't you know how many people drown in that river every year? Why would I know that? Everybody knows that. Never swim in the brazzers. First of all, I wasn't swimming. And second no. That's not a thing everybody knows. But Jack was ranting now. And why? Why can't you swim in the brazzers? Because it's sandy at the bottom, and so the current makes eddies, and the eddies carve caverns in that sandy floor of the river, and the current swirls around in there like liquid tornadoes, and if you're unlucky or stupid enough to get sucked into one, you're done for. That's some pretty specialized knowledge, there I started, coughing some more. So, Jack went on, like I wasn't even talking, when idiots decide to go swimming or fishing or wading in that water, the next thing they know, they are pulled into the undertow. Whole families die trying to save each other, one by one. Did he just call me an idiot? I tried to decide if it was worse than being the epitome of ordinary. So. Not a riptide then. I eyed the water, so tranquil looking from here. 
I could still feel the pull of it, like some liquid death magnet. Suddenly there were shivers prickling my arms and legs. Scary, I said, almost to myself. My calmness just seemed to make him madder. Scary? Jack yelled. You're damn right. What the hell were you thinking? I don't know, I said, turning to him now. I was hot. The water felt nice. You were hot, he said, in a tone like he'd asked me why I was drinking gasoline and I told him I was thirsty. He went on. Do you have a death wish? Do you? Because here's why it's called the Brazzers. From Los Brazzers de Dios, which means the arms of God, and people think it's from thirsty travelers who were so grateful to find water, but it's actually because it drowns so many people that it's where God collects their souls. Yikes. Okay. That took a dark turn. I will grant that Jack was conveying an important safety tip. But, I mean, really? I was obviously half drowned and super shaken. Did he have to yell? I don't know about you, but I can only get yelled at for so long before I start yelling back. Jack wanted to yell. Fine. I could yell, too. I could yell all day. Why are you yelling at me? I yelled. Another first for me yelling at a client. Because. Jack yelled back. You're going to get yourself killed. Not on purpose. I yelled back. That doesn't matter once you're dead. Jack yelled. People wade into water all the time. I yelled. It's a totally normal thing to do. Not in the Brazzers. But I didn't know that. And if you go under, then I go under, because then I have to go in after you. So don't go in after me. That's not how this works. If you die in the river, I die in the river. And I really don't want to fucking die in the fucking river. For a second, I had no response. I didn't know what to say to that. And in that second, I realized something else, I was shaking. A lot. Hard. From some place deep in my core. Most likely, it was fear. Though it didn't feel like fear. But maybe I'd just forgotten what fear felt like. Usually, the antidote to fear was preparation, but I hadn't been prepared for anything about this week, from watching my job mutate into something I didn't even recognize, to moving in with a bunch of strangers, to losing my best friend, to winding up in the middle of some hate fest between Jack and his brother, to being called ordinary, to almost drowning, and now, to getting yelled at like I hadn't been yelled at in years. It was a lot. Suddenly, it was too much. What am I? I demanded then. Some kind of historian of the Texas waterways. How exactly am I supposed to know that this is a river of death? I'm just living my life in the city, trying to get to London, or Korea, or anywhere at all that's literally not Texas, and suddenly I'm having to move to a cattle ranch and act in this crazy reality show with you and your family. I didn't want this job, I didn't ask for it, and now I'm trapped in it with no escape for weeks on end. So maybe you could give me a heads up if I'm about to accidentally kill myself or anyone else. And right here is where my voice broke. Right here is where I lost hold of angry and my emotions just kind of crumbled. By the time I finished with instead of just yelling at me out of nowhere like an asshole, my voice sounded broken, even to me. I froze, and so did Jack, as we both registered that I'd just called my employer an asshole. I would have liked to march off right then in a gesture of self-respect, but everything was trembling, including my legs. Without even really thinking, I reached up to touch my beaded safety pin. I just wanted a quick hit of that tiny sparkle of comfort I always got when I felt the beads. But it wasn't there. My neck was bare. The necklace was gone, too. Hey, I said, looking down. Where's my safety pin? Your what? 
I pawed at my collarbones, like I might find it if I kept trying. My safety pin. With the beads. It's gone. Had it come off in the water? Was it somewhere on the beach? I started searching the sand. That colored safety pin you always wear, he asked, forgetting we were fighting and starting to look, too. It must have fallen off, I said. I paced the beach, retracing all my steps. I'd been warm on the walk down, but now, after the shock of the river, I felt the opposite. I was drenched, and cold, and I couldn't stop shivering. But I didn't care. As we looked, Jack's entire demeanor softened. We'll find it, he said. Don't worry. Then he added, I'm really good at finding things. I looked up, and when I did, I realized just how vast that beach was, compared to a safety pin. This beach was like infinity. We were never going to find it. And then I did what anybody might do, I guess, in that situation. I started to cry. Jack didn't even hesitate. He closed the distance between us and wrapped his arms around damp, trembling, uncharacteristically shaky me and kept them there a minute. Then he stepped back and took off his flannel overshirt, put it on me and buttoned the buttons, and then pulled me back into his arms. I'm sorry, he said, and now I was hearing his voice muffled through his chest. I'm sorry you lost your safety pin, and I'm sorry you almost drowned, and I'm sorry I yelled at you. I should have warned you. It's completely my fault. You just scared me, is all. Was he stroking my hair? Was Jack Stapleton stroking my hair? Or was it just the wind? He held me for a long time like that, there on that beach. He held me until my tears had dried up and I'd stopped shaking. Another first, the first time a client had ever hugged me and the first time I'd ever allowed it. And as mad at him as I still was, I also really didn't mind. He seemed to have a knack for it. Jack wound UP carrying me piggyback all the way to the house. At first, he was just going to take me up the river bank and through the overgrown grass, just back to the gravel road. But once we got there, he just kept on walking. I'm good now, I said, my legs dangling. You can let me down. This is my workout for the day. I can walk. I'm fine. I like carrying you. I might start doing it all the time. I know how to walk. I'm sure you do. So put me down. Don't think so. Why not? Mostly cause it's getting dark, and lots of things that bite come out at dusk. You won't be able to see where you're stepping. And you're bare-legged, like an amateur. We've already established that's not my fault. So what I'm doing right now is chivalrous protecting you from danger. Ah. Also, I feel bad for making you cry. You did not make me cry. Jack gave a little have it your way pause. Then he said, also, it's fun. So you're really not going to put me down? I'm really not. Of course, as we went, I couldn't help but assess safety aspects of the property. That was my brain's default activity. I made mental maps of the layout, including potential hiding spots for bad actors, potential escape routes in emergencies, and areas to monitor. All, of course, before Jack told me that his parents never locked their doors at night. Oh my god, you have to make them do that. I've been trying to for years. Not good. I'd be highlighting that in tonight's log. And yet, a lot of my usual anxieties felt unusually muted, there on Jack Stapleton's back. Maybe it was the rhythm of his walking. Or the velvetiness of his flannel shirt enrobing me. Or the solidness of his shoulder under my chin. Or that cinnamon scent that seemed to follow him everywhere. Or maybe it's just objectively hard to worry about anything when you're getting a piggyback ride. I could feel the muscles in his back shifting and tightening with each step, especially as we made our way uphill. I could feel him breathing through his ribcage. I could feel the warmth of his body where we were pressed together. 
I won't lie. It was nice. Too nice, maybe. You really can set me down, I said. But nothing doing. We're almost there, Jack said. So I guess I had no choice but to stay there and enjoy it. 14. Hell of a first day. That night, as promised, I slept on the floor. Jack found a yoga mat in the hall closet, and I folded a couple of blankets on top of it. It was fine. I was fine. I was comfortable being uncomfortable. At least I wasn't sleeping in a closet. I'd slept in a million crazy places, hallways, rooftops, even a broken elevator once. What I hadn't done, though, was sleep in a room with Jack Stapleton. A little off-putting. Not gonna lie. Would you like to know what Jack Stapleton does with his pillow when he sleeps? He doesn't rest his head on it like regular people do. He shoves it under his body, vertically, like a surfboard, and then drapes himself over it. And wanna know what he wears for PJs? Loose sweatpants and an aggressively clingy undershirt. But what does he do with his dirty clothes when he changes into those PJs? He leaves them all over the bathroom floor. I walked in when it was my turn to change and found his muddy boots, his wadded socks, the t-shirt he'd worn all day, and his still damp jeans, with the belt still in the loops and the underwear still inside, just lying there on the floor, splayed out in an almost human shape, like a bearskin rug made of Jack Stapleton's dirty laundry. I mean, I had to step over them to get to the sink to brush my teeth. When I came out of the bathroom, Jack was sitting on the edge of his bed. He looked up. I stared at him, like what the hell? And he frowned back, like what? So I pointed back at the bathroom floor and said, can you come deal with this? But Jack just tilted his head. Hey, I said. This is a shared space. You can't leave your crap all over the floor. But Jack was looking me up and down. Hello? I said. Is that what you're sleeping in? I looked down. Um. Yes? Is that what you always sleep in? I looked up, like what? Sometimes. I didn't even know they still made those. I looked down again. Nightgowns? I mean, Jack said, and now he was looking at me like I was funny. You look like a Victorian child. It's a nightgown, I said. It's a normal piece of human sleepwear. Nope. People wear nightgowns, Jack. Not like that one, they don't. Hey, I said. I'm not making fun of what you're wearing. What I'm wearing is normal. I shuffled over to his mirror and looked at myself. White cotton. Short sleeves. A little ruffle below the knees. I do not look like a Victorian child. A Victorian child would have lace and ribbons. And a little cap on its head. Pretty close, though. I was just trying to bring girlfriend-like sleepwear. I've never seen a girlfriend in anything even close. Your girlfriends probably only sleep in thongs. At the maximum. Jack gave an exaggerated sigh and gazed up at the ceiling as if remembering it fondly. I checked my reflection again. This seemed, I said, in my own defense, like the most professional of all my sleepwear options. But I mean, is it yours? Of course it's mine. You think I stole it? Yeah from a 90-year-old grandma. Now I was annoyed. He'd called me a lot of insulting things today, from plain, to an idiot, to the epitome of ordinary. Now he was saying grandma. To my face. Somehow, this was the best retort I could manage, you're not in a position to throw shade, Mr. Clothes all over the floor. It was supposed to be a burn, but Jack just started laughing. Like really laughing, his shoulders shaking and everything. That's a terrible burn, he said. I think that's the worst burn I've ever heard. It's not funny, 
I said. I'm sorry, he said, tumping over and pressing his face against the bedspread. But it absolutely is funny. Hey! I said. Nobody wants to see your underwear. Actually, he said, sitting back up and sobering his face. People pay very good money to see my underwear. Not your dirty underwear. On the bathroom floor. But he just gave a little trust me on this nod. You'd be surprised. Well, I said, feeling like I needed to make this point. I am not one of those people. I know. It's a thing I like about you. Was he trying to weasel out of picking up his mess by flattering me? I tried again. Let me ask you this. Am I your maid? The more he tried to keep a straight face, the more his face seemed to fight with him. We established that on day one. Then let's just agree that I won't make you interact with my dirty underwear, and you won't make me interact with yours. Okay. Okay, he said, trying to make his face serious. Agreed. But now he had the giggles. Jack Stapleton had the giggles. He fell back down on the bed. Go, I said, walking over to him and shoving at his shoulder to push him off the bed. Go pick up your dirty clothes. He resisted for a second, so I pushed harder, and then, on purpose, he gave way fast and I fell onto the floor landing on my sleeping nest. Fine with me. It was time for bed anyway. And don't leave your toothpaste cap off, either, I said. What are you, five years old? It's my bathroom, he said. It's our bathroom now. Be why the time Jack came out, I'd already turned off all the lights, and he tripped over me making his way back to his bed. Watch it. Sorry. He climbed under his covers and hung his head over the side to talk to me like we were having a sleepover. You really can sleep in the bed, you know. No, thank you. It's bothering me that you're on the ceramic tile. Get over it. We could build, like, a wall of pillows down the middle as a barrier. I'm good. What if my mom walks in and sees you sleeping on the floor? I hadn't seen his mom since we'd been here. Does your mom just walk into the bedroom of her adult son without knocking? Probably not. Good point. And even if she did, we could just say we were fighting. Which is true. We're not fighting, Jack said. We're playing. Is that what this is? The moon came out from behind the clouds and the room lightened a bit. I could see Jack's face above me. He was still looking down. Thank you, he said then. For what? For coming here and doing this, even though you didn't want to. And for not drowning today. And for wearing that ridiculous nightgown. I turned on my side to ignore him, but I could still feel him watching me. After a while he said, I really do have nightmares, you know. Apologies in advance if I wake you. What should I do if you have one? I asked. Just ignore me, Jack said. So much easier said than done. I will absolutely try my best. 